Demon King, Junior, Piccolo. Strangely enough, character lives in our hearts as one of the top OGs in fiction no matter what seems to happen to him and Dragon Ball, whether it be his appearance in the movies always being cold and stoic, or how he always lives in our hearts through the fandom, video games, and his unique role and growth throughout the series. Since I already made How Strong Is Goku, I thought I'd go over Piccolo next as I already implied. His scaling and journey are quite a bit different than his, much more than say Vegeta or even Gohan most of the time. With his new resurrection in Dragon Ball Super Superhero, the old love for Piccolo has once again resurfaced, with people wanting to see him on the front screen once again. So let's give our green friend some props and go over his entire history right now. An interesting thing about Piccolo is he sort of starts off as someone else entirely from what most people know of him now, with our first introduction to him as basically Dragon Ball's version of Satan, or Demon King Piccolo, who was cast down to Earth by Kami, or God, to wreak havoc so Kami could be the pure-hearted guardian of Earth and fulfill his own ambitions. So unlike Goku, who starts off rather humbly, especially for a Saiyan super fighter, still thinking bullets hurt and so on with a bit of training, Piccolo Piccolo sort of starts off as a complete world-ending demonic enigma that even God is hesitant about dealing with. Of course, because it would be the end of him if he erased Piccolo, but still, quite the difference. As a forewarning, this King Piccolo section won't be too crazily different than it was in How Strong Is Goku, if you've already seen it, but it will become more unique by the time the next arc comes around. I'm mainly including it because it's technically Piccolo, so there are obviously some unique Piccolo-only things in the anime and the guide to two, I can't wait to go over, so stay tuned. From the get-go, King Piccolo and his henchmen begin their assault on Earth by immediately targeting martial artists and looking for the Dragon Balls, with Tambourine easily defeating Krillin, in which it is implied to be just one kick or so in most materials, while fatigued Goku stands no chance against Tambourine and is obliterated after the 22nd Budokai Tenkaichi. With King Piccolo etched across Master Roshi's mind, he makes quite an insane statement that even in his youth, not he, the Crane Hermit, or Master Master Mutaito could ever hope to beat him. And this is a crazy introduction as Master Roshi is basically the definition of a Moonbuster, whether it be old and rusty or more up to date in the tournament arcs as to not let the new generation fold him so easily. He stated in pretty much almost every single piece of material ever to be able to destroy the moon and vaporize it with a Kamehameha, with most people that are high level martial artists at the bare minimum knowing Jackie Chun could do so, with Tien thinking he can beat Jackie Chun. In the end, anime, Goku also tries to fight Mutaito, and Mutaito can block multiple strikes from him, even after Goku literally beats King Piccolo, which is weird. So, it could be implied that Goku holds back on him, or Mutaito didn't even attempt fighting King Piccolo all that much, and just went to seal him with the Mafuba. Or Roshi is just trying to say to Tien, when he tries to go off and fight King Piccolo, you'll whoop your ass, boy, knock it off. Should be noted that the Daizenshu also questions if Roshi in his youth was actually superior to the old man Roshi that we see in the series in terms of skills, and that's some food for thought. Anyway, by the time Dragon Ball Chapter 136 rolls around, Goku tries to fight Tambourine, ignoring Roshi's advice, and gets folded when so enraged you'd think he'd go Super Saiyan. Although it doesn't really mean much, as we then get confirmation that if Goku wasn't tired and could eat something, he could easily have beaten Tambourine, who one-shot Krillin, which in early Dragon Ball hunger was actually like Goku's kryptonite, as well as his post-tournament exhaustion. After this though, King Piccolo is revealed for the first time, we see him as an old man looking to obtain his youthful power power once again, which he states is infinite power that would flow through him. King Piccolo might be able to destroy the universe? No, seriously, but infinite can just mean very great, but hey, maybe if this was Bleach or Naruto, people would say King Piccolo could destroy the universe after all joking. Later, Goku faces off against Yajirobe and says he's tougher than anybody he's ever fought before. Now, toughness can either apply to durability or overall combat ability, so I'll leave that up to you guys to decide. After he says that he dodges Symbol's electric lightning like blast and then chops through Symbol with his sword after getting serious, which apparently impresses Goku even further after he already said Yajirobe was the most tough guy he's ever fought. This is important because we then learn Tambourine is several times stronger than Symbol, and this is a hench that old King Piccolo can kind of spawn, who 
made the toughest guy Goku ever met have to get serious and impress him even further beyond that statement. Several in most dictionaries meaning three times, by the way. It's not impossible for Goku to have gotten this much stronger just after fighting Tien if you think Symbol rivals the 22nd Budokai. As even in DBZ, Krillin states that as a child, after massive battles, Goku's always got a power-up, or Zenkai's. It was not just a concept that only applied when Goku was older, and this may be one of the more obvious first signs of that. This new Goku gets angry and faces off against Tambourine, folding him easily with a combo and actually scares Yajirobe, showing Goku reached quite a new level already since his fight with Tien. These assassins, like Symbol and Tambourine, that can potentially rough up the 22nd Budokai fighters and would give old man Roshi quite the scare, give or take, are beings that Piccolo can just sort of hurl out of his mouth in the form of an egg, which means technically that this Piccolo can probably do something similar. Weird, considering the old Demon King used to apparently be able to make armies of these offspring and retain his spot as the apex predator even during the times of Mutaito and young Roshi, meaning he can kind of just flood the earth with spawns and like swarms of these potentially moon-level demons. It's a weird detail that I wonder will ever be touched on in the future. Well, it kind of does, but I'll get into that more later. This is significant as Roshi then says, even with everyone as a group, we'd stand no chance against Piccolo. Roshi being the guy who can annihilate the moon in seconds, and Tien being able to fight a guy who can dodge beam and laser guns, as stated in Dragon Ball Forever guides when Goku was fighting the battle jacket, while also potentially reacting to light flashes, now altogether jumping Piccolo just can't do anything. Although it's unsure if Roshi is referring to old Piccolo or if he knows it quite yet. However, there is some good evidence that it could be referring to old King Piccolo as well, as Roshi doesn't ever seem to back down from this thought, even when seeing Piccolo as an old fart. It's then further backed up by Piccolo almost killing the new possibly three times amped Zenkai Goku in almost three hits while not at half power. Which is insane if you think that 22nd Budokai Kid Goku surpassed or could make Roshi scared, or feel surpassed, because that'd make old Piccolo able to bust the moon six times over, even as an old fart, if you were super generous with that tambourine scaling. Otherwise, he is easily still above that moon tier, if you think Roshi is referring to this form. For a battle shown in only at chapter 143, this is pretty insane. And Old King Piccolo then tanks Goku's strongest Kamehameha and doesn't even flinch, then one-shots him. If it weren't for a Dragon Ball and a totally not implied future wish on the two-ball Shenron in outer space made by Goku's father, Bardock, Goku probably would have been dead here for sure. Piccolo was so powerful that Goku really did need plot armor, and he's nowhere near even his normal strength with that kid Goku soloing most battle shonens by himself with ease. It's then stated by Piano, Piccolo's servant, that when he regains his youth, this old strength that's already soloing Goku in about three hits will be nothing in comparison. In obvious and quick fashion, Piccolo succeeds in regaining his youth and becoming everything Pilaf thought he wanted to be, with Piccolo's first order of business to execute Shenron that Roshi thought might be able to wish Piccolo down. This is another insane feat if you think Kami and later Dragon Ball remade the moon using Shenron, and the Demon King that can wipe away cities with just a single gesture and with zero difficulty, just as an intimidation tactic, with him saying that he can further turn anything the king sees when he's threatening him, the king of the world, into a desert, which would include the rest of the king city, all the way up to the mountain range in the horizon after declaring if he annoys him, he won't think twice about destroying his entire world. While it is definitely debatable, and probably unlikely Piccolo can destroy an entire planet, at least in one hit, as someone who can destroy a moon multiple times over, surface wiping the planet would probably actually not be that difficult of a task. Goku survives due to definitely not plot armor once again, and totally definitely Bardock's wish shown in Dragon Ball Super many decades later, and goes to Korin to become stronger, which Korin says he can't really teach Goku anything else, and Goku has more power than him. Korin says this after witnessing Goku fight Piccolo as an old man earlier, and this is further confirmation of that Zenkai theory, and the Yajirobe theory, as Korin in V-Jump is confirmed to have a power level of 190, with Tien Shinhan and Goku in the 22nd Budokai having levels of 180. And Goku has done no training since then, he's only really just gotten beat up. These power levels are also obviously not linear, or else a power level of 5, being a normal human, may be able to annihilate a little bit more than a hamburger if 180 can vaporize a moon. 
Anyway, now that Goku is stronger than Korin, Korin has to whip out the real Divine Water that was used as a joke earlier in the series during the Red Ribbon Army arc, where the Divine Water was just normal tap water. But this is the real version, and Korin thinks that without it, Goku would have to train for several more years. To reach the level of King Piccolo, which granted isn't really that bad considering martial arts masters training for decades could never hope to do that. It's also debatable if any of the new generation like Tien and Krillin could reach this level by the time of the 23rd Budokai, but that's debatable. But surprisingly, three years is a pretty accurate gauge considering what happens in the next arc. But Goku doesn't have the time as we learn in chapter 153. Piccolo is going to annihilate 143rd of the earth in one attack every year to cause chaos and torment. In terms of anime-only stuff for this arc, all we really get is King Piccolo sort of T-posing down to King Castle for some reason, saying he's immune to conventional weapons. There's also a guy in King Castle who was apparently called to fight Piccolo and is decently confident when weapons won't work. Piccolo, who can also sense Ki, also offers a job for this guy to be his servant for some reason. Who actually was this random guy in King's Castle? Was, was he stronger than the Ox King or something? Why did Piccolo even give him the time of day? Either way, he gets one shot, but it's still sort of weird world building. There's just some random strong guard for the king in there. That 143rd of the Earth statement, I'm going to get into a little bit later, but some of these sections of the planet include islands as big as continents and so forth. But moving on, during Goku's six-hour torture session from drinking the divine water, we see the Uzaro within him scream and then he awakens to new strength. The Uzaro itself is a ten times power level amp. I want to make that clear, power level, not just linear. So that obviously isn't the case, or else his power level would be like 1900 right now, with King Piccolo at peak hitting 260. But him getting a linear 10 times amp might actually be somewhat easier to argue. And even while suppressed, the new youthful King Piccolo has multiple times the strength of the old one, and can be felt all around the world, with it only taking under half power old Piccolo to almost three shot Goku before. Although saying Goku got a 10 times amp is head cannon, his power multiplies numerous times to match the Demon King. We then see just the henchman of King Piccolo drum can bully Tien low difficulty, and Goku can blow his head in half with a single kick. Since this is a Piccolo video, it is important to go over the infamous King Piccolo statement in Daizenshu 7, where his power rivals a small nuclear bomb when it's at its maximum. I'll give a more detailed description of this than in my last video. An important detail to start off with this is that the most common translation of this is actually a bit misguided, with a more accurate translation saying something like more akin to, the power to easily erase the city is comparable to a small type nuclear bomb, in which Piccolo's ability to casually wipe cities is being compared to small nuclear bombs in Dragon Ball, which can apparently do something similar. But it should be noted that Piccolo's ability is not something used for area of effect damage, but more so for attack potency. This is backed up in the Daizenshu with the technique Piccolo uses against Goku in this fight as more akin to a special beam cannon or big bang attack condensed type attack rather than the likes of the Kamehameha, which are more potency focused moves that also have a larger destructive radius. King Piccolo is also going to vaporize 1 43rd of the Earth's surface every year in an instant with one attack, with some of these districts containing islands whose sizes are as big as small continents. Should be noted further that Black from the Red Ribbon Army arc had a battle jacket that can launch missiles that could easily blow away mountains that no small nuke could ever hope to achieve. Unless you think that if Black launched a missile at King Piccolo and he stood there laughing at like the tiny human thinking he could hurt him with weaponry, he stated he was above, just would get vaporized by the battle jacket bomb, which would be quite nuts. Roshi should have just launched a 1 100,000th power Kamehameha and he would have just annihilated King Piccolo easily since he could blow up the moon and wipe it from existence. Was King Piccolo actually just the ultimate bluffer? Maybe Roshi just blew away an illusion of the moon, like that Dragon Ball Z Kakarot game likes to meme. Joking. Anyway, I think anyone with common sense will know this statement is just referring to the area of effect of his attack and not his actual attack potency. Should be simple enough. Piccolo and Sun go full power against each other, completely eclipsing what Roshi is capable of 100% by this point. Tien can't even see many attacks Goku can do, despite Tien being able to see a Goku who could dodge potential light speed attacks earlier when he was way weaker, depending on who you ask, of course, unless you think he doesn't surpass lightning speed until later. Eventually, our king wipes out the whole city down to the mountain range in the distance. However, the mountains are still intact, and by this point, we learn that Piccolo using his full power gradually wears down his lifespan, while Goku can't use much 
much of his full power normally due to missing one leg at full capacity. Eventually, Goku loses most of his limbs as he sacrifices them to save Tien Shinhan, and in one final clash, Goku uses his Uzaru inner spirit and launches himself through King Piccolo and finishes him off. Before King Piccolo dies, he lays one last egg and then explodes for some reason. And this last egg bearing his own son, Ma Jr., the Piccolo we all know and love today. The scene is a bit weird when you consider that Piccolo later is shown with massive regeneration abilities that Cell actually steals from him that allows him to regenerate half of his ripped off body. Piccolo also has insane regeneration feats later during the Boo arc where he can regenerate from being shattered into a ton of pieces as a statue. So you can imply that the stronger a Namekian is, the better his regeneration is perhaps, or the greater his key pool, the greater it is, or that Demon King Piccolo was just really limited for some reason. As if he just regenerated the hole in his gut, he could have just gone to win the fight anyway. So you could imply that, or maybe he thought he was toast as Namekian regeneration weakens you a lot and he just saw Goku go Uzaru fist mode or he was too tired and low on energy at this point to even manage that. Up to you guys to decide on that one. One little fun fact about King Piccolo is that he isn't a normal fighter. He is a pure evil incarnation split from Kami, the guardian or god of earth. So because he is pure evil and a demon, when people are killed by him, they can't go to the afterlife. Scary. Now let's get started with the story of the son of said demon king. Ma Jr. The 23rd Budokai arc for the anime, or perhaps even the end of the King Piccolo arc if you want to call it that, is a bit different than the manga, and in the anime we get four episodes to slowly gas up the new menace growing in the background that the Demon King shot out before literally imploding, showing him slowly grow in power and in evil. And in the first introduction to the new Piccolo, is that he is sort of like a Dr. Seuss Grinch type character, but maybe a bit meaner, where he torches down some old people's houses, then says how much he hates Goku. He's hating on Goku right out of the womb at like two weeks of age. Whether or not he can actually manipulate fire or something is unknown, but he's definitely not happy. In Dragon Ball episode 124, our little menace returns once again up to no good. He's watching a birthday party and sees some kid getting a toy plane, and this makes him very upset. Parentage seems to be quite the trigger for the new Piccolo for some reason, maybe because he's salty about how his only parent seemed to implode. Anyway, in this scene, he creates a ruckus and seemingly blitzes the people in the house by destroying almost everything in the home before they can turn around, then skedaddles away in a hurry. Blitzing people can usually require subsonic or higher levels of speed, but considering the next scene that is unlikely to be the case here, and it seems more like he chaotically banged through the house in a cinematic montage, and the people then awkwardly notice later. Apparently, he is probably slower than a normal hunting dog, as a house dog catches up to him pretty fast when he trips for a moment. To defend himself, he casts his first bit of key and shoots a blast that sends the dog flying and has him do a Looney Tunes bonk into the ground, causing him to be knocked out like a Pokemon. Considering Goku pretty much in his pre-teens with some martial arts training, his first key blast dending a car door, Piccolo's first key blast with zero training at like three weeks or something sending a dog flying is pretty good. Although it's quite silly to think that this is our next big bad man. I guess it shows he is growing in evil and in power. Speaking of which, we see him again in an episode 125 where he gets quite the power up it seems from his scary dog encounter and Grinch escapades. In this scene, two royal soldiers seem to be scouting out an area of some kind of beast in the woods while riding on, and I'm not joking, Star Wars speeders. They then eventually confront the menace and he grabs a gun and cracks it in stereotypical fashion, and luckily for our little goblin man, the Star Wars knockoffs don't have actual laser guns and instead try to shoot him with some type of machine gun that he can actually react to at basically point blank and Kylo rends the bullets in midair causing them to run in fear. Showing Piccolo is probably a lot more skilled and fast than when he was in his terrifying bout against the house dog earlier. Our final mission and showing of this gremlin is in episode 126, where Piccolo now has the terrifying ability to stand on water and stare at boats menacingly. Considering Piccolo is still probably no more than weeks old, Naruto would probably be a bit jealous. As the people on the boat see this absolute eldritch abomination of evil, Standing on the water staring at them, they freak out, as they should. And Piccolo death beams their boat and blows it in half. 
definitely a step up from his dog KO earlier. He also eats a fish here, which as we learn later, he doesn't actually have to eat food, as revealed by Dende during a meal with Krillin, Gohan, and Bulma much later in the series. So that must make this Piccolo super evil. A weird detail about him is that since he is technically not born wearing anything in the anime, is incredibly antisocial, and is sort of on a hate spree, him getting his outfit is sort of a mystery. Whether he learned how to make it, was given it, or inherently knew the clothes beam, and this was immense foreshadowing for that ability, all the answers for that are sort of weird. In the manga, he doesn't even have this buildup. He just instantly hatches with his full drip, hating Goku. As a fun fact here, you'll notice in the anime that Mad Wolf is revived by the Dragon Balls after the defeat of King Piccolo, and has a huge cross over his grave. I made a joke in my How Strong Is Goku video about how they say Jesus Christ in the anime when they face off against Fang the Vampire during the Baba's tournament portion of the Red Ribbon Army Saga. But did you know that it's actually confirmed that people practice Christianity and Buddhism in the Dragon Ball universe, with it sort of being a joke that none of them know about Kami actually pulling the strings. So those little references were an actual in-universe thing and not just a gag to appeal to us in the real world, which I thought was a funny detail. Before we get to the time skip, I guess it's important to note that Goku thinks Popo is the strongest guy he's ever fought and has to move as fast as lightning while being perfectly calm, as described in the manga and shown literally in the anime. And this is important because leading up to this, Kami can just flick full power post King Piccolo fight Goku in the face and no diff him, which I guess is sort of a, an important detail as Kami sort of becomes Piccolo later. So I'll kind of mention some peculiarities about Kami that I think are interesting when we get to it later as they do eventually all apply to Piccolo. Finally, after three years, the tournament begins and the time skip is completed and we immediately learn after this time the new Piccolo is stronger than King Piccolo and considering what he was doing at a few weeks old, I guess we shouldn't be surprised. Kami remade the moon during this time, and Roshi is very adamant that he is just not anything anymore. I'm not joking, he just repeats this over and over to everyone, that everyone is stronger than him now just numerous times. At first, he says his powers don't even reach Goku's feet, and then he just stands no chance against all these kids, period. So, unless he just means Piccolo and Goku, this would include Krillin, and probably Yamcha and Tien as well. Although it's sort of dubious, as in DBZ, Yamcha's power level reaches 177 on Raditz Scouter, and Roshi's can hit up to 180 when he faced off against King Piccolo, but maybe Yamcha was suppressed or has grown rusty over the five years, whereas the others grow stronger. Roshi also directly says Yamcha surpasses him too, which will get this future scaling a little bit crazy. A little anime snip that's not in the manga that is pretty unique and good here is in episode 143, where we see Piccolo talking to the Z Fighters and King Piccolo is shown overlapping him and his words, showing he really is like Demon King Piccolo under all of that, which sort of makes that whole Grinch adventure kind of dorky. Although he seems a bit different, he still possesses many memories. So what do you guys think? It sort of makes Piccolo feel a lot different when you think he is actually that old demon guy from before, doesn't it? Although obviously a bit different after he's reborn. The first bits that directly apply to Piccolo here are that Shen, Kami in disguise, can beat up Yajirobe while kind of just joking around. Shen is also interesting as if Piccolo gained any of Kami's knowledge, he could also <coughs> technically just possess people's bodies like this. But maybe it's a, a Kami-only technique that you have to have some kind of planetary guardian license for. It's called borrowing the body and also nurse the user for a perfect disguise. It maybe that would have been useful in Superhero when Piccolo was infiltrating the Red Ribbon Army. Apparently, the air punch that Goku uses to blitz and one-shot Chi-Chi is a demon clan move, meaning he too can blitz and one-shot with an air punch Chi-Chi, who has a power level of 130 in V-Jump, making her even stronger than Mr. Shen, or the Crane Hermit, and almost as strong as Roshi when he first started fighting Tien and not yet at full power. So this is sort of a guess, being even safe, just a casual mountain vaporizing air blast and possibly up to country to moon levels, depending on how strong you think Roshi was when he negged the moon. I guess this really is just the OG version of Hirodora from Naruto. Before we get to Goku vs Piccolo, we do get a few other fun fights such as Piccolo vs Krillin, 
Krillin is surprisingly tough here, and honestly, this just might be a section to hype him up and not Piccolo. Krillin thinks he can help take on Cyborg Tao, who in V-Jump has a parallel of 210 with the Super Dodon Ray, and is many times stronger than he was before. Thinking he can defeat Tien from the 22nd Budokai, which going by the level seems to be no joke. The Z Fighters also think that Piccolo is many times stronger than before, and Krillin thinks he stands a chance and using a lot of his skills actually lands a bunch of blows on Piccolo, with Piccolo actually has to resort to showing his true power and pretty much three shots him. After it's revealed, Piccolo can stretch his arms and so forth, which shocks Goku. However, Piccolo, in Krillin's credit, just overpowers him by perception blitzing him with an afterimage. This is where you get into the discussion of, is Piccolo actually wearing weights like Goku here? Or did Piccolo sort of start wearing weights during the Saiyan Saga because Goku did? Because Piccolo then comments, taking over the world might not be so easy, when he thought he might have used too much power and killed Krillin, which he didn't. I'd say personally that Piccolo is still at least very suppressed here, as we learn later that Goku missing all his limbs is pretty much stronger than a hundred of the Z Fighters tag teaming Piccolo alongside Kami. So either Piccolo grows stronger as he fights Goku later, or is just wearing weights, or is some type of suppress. An argument people use as well is that Piccolo keeps his turban on pretty much the entire fight, and if it was a super heavy weight, it wouldn't really make a lot of sense. But it's not impossible. All in all, pretty good Krillin showing, and you'll actually notice Krillin has a tendency of putting up pretty good fights until about the end of the Cell Saga for zero reason. Goku then has a pretty epic fight against Tien, but it doesn't really mean a whole lot right now as Tien himself just quotes Goku wasn't really trying. Tien did think Goku's speed was the same as it was against Demon King Piccolo though, but he was just stronger and more durable, so keep that in mind. He also thinks the Tri-Beam is too dangerous even for a guy who is stronger than King Piccolo in his mind, with Goku's best stats in Tien's mind being his toughness, stamina, and durability. Although he does quote that Goku might be able to just dodge it with his weights off too. This toughness statement may further reinforce the Yajirobe's toughness statement earlier, and could just be referring to durability, but once again, you guys decide. But one thing for sure is it really helps illustrate how strong Majunior is, as Tien thinks a tri-beam is too dangerous for a guy stronger than King Piccolo, unless you think he's referring to his own lifespan, but he does say it is dangerous for him and Goku. Finally, we get to Shen versus Piccolo, or Kami in disguise. The only thing we really learn here is that Piccolo is much greater than Kami, even if Kami was at full power. So everything that scales to Kami, Piccolo is now just above inherently. It also means that any wish of power that Shenron can make, Piccolo scales above that as well. So if you think that Kami remakes the moon with Shenron, and not literally Kami, etc. Tien also says both Piccolo and Shen are way beyond human ability, and Roshi thinks they are too strong, even. Eventually, we learn that Kami can launch the Mafuba, and Piccolo can straight up reverse it. Whether or not Piccolo can actually use his own Mafuba is a bit debatable, but if he can, the Mafuba is a pretty interesting move that honestly is sort of thrown aside later in the series, at least in Z, for zero reason. The Mafuba went shot by Roshi later in Super, as an example, and then is reversed by Frost, can still seal away Super Saiyan Vegeta, who can beat Roshi and Frost with no difficulty. It can also seal away immortal beings like Zamasu, even with a Super Shenron seal of approval, and is apparently the most terrifying thing ever that gives Zamasu a panic attack, and makes King Piccolo scared for his life even upon thinking it's going to appear. Even if you think Piccolo can only reverse this powerful sealing move when he fuses with Kami later, he for sure should be able to use it and even teaches it to future Trunks over a smartphone video. And I'm not joking by the way, that actually happens. One thing happens in Piccolo vs Shen is that Piccolo can read Kami's mind as well. Whether or not he could read anyone's mind is a bit debatable, as Piccolo wasn't shocked that he could read Kami's mind, but he can at least read Kami's mind from a distance, who is in Shen's body. After this, we just get more of the statements of Majunior is way above King Piccolo, but then we get the statement by Tien that even if they all rushed Cape Piccolo all at the same time, they would stand zero chance, showing that he showed much more power against Chen than he probably did against Krillin earlier. It also implies that the attack that might vaporize King Piccolo would do nothing to him, 
or he would just speed blitz Tien, which is actually implied further later when we learn Piccolo is even stronger than they think right now. Piccolo also gives a lecture here that confirms some V-Jump power level scans, in which people are confused by Z-Kami having a power level of 220, which is less than King Piccolo at 260, when Kami can flick away the Goku who beat him. But we learn that Kami actually is just sitting around growing rusty in heaven, or Kami's lookout, and gets weaker as time goes on, and is reaching a relatively old age, where he's going to die of old age actually soon. And remember, King Piccolo did have to wish for youth again, and Kami isn't any younger or of a different gene pool. So by the time Dragon Ball Z comes around, Kami is actually weaker than King Piccolo. But as it stands right now, that's not the case. Goku vs Piccolo finally begins in Chapter 182, and they just sort of fool around a bit before going near their maximums in Chapter 184. While near full power, they both have impressive speed showings against each other, with Sun dodging Piccolo's eye lasers at point-blank range, and Piccolo being able to tag Goku when he's concealing his presence with high movement that Tien can't seem to see. Goku also has to redirect one of Junior's key blasts, which sort of make a King Piccolo-like blast in the distance, with Roshi saying if Sun hadn't done that, they'd all be reduced to atoms. These atomic level attacks are interesting as we also learn Future Trunks turns Mecha Frieza into atoms later. So it could just be Roshi using hyperbole, but it is evidence that even at this stage, they might be able to do that. In Chapter 185, Goku finally unleashes the Super Kamehameha for the first time, which in Daizenshu is confirmed to be able to shatter the moon. So even if you didn't believe that whole stronger than Roshi by many tiers scaling, well, now they are just that level, even without a direct line of scaling to Roshi. In B-Jump, this Goku Super Kamehameha hits a power level of 910, which may seem insane to some people, but I'll get into it, which Piccolo can fight with and then tank by covering his face with his arms, showing his durability is even greater than an actual celestial body. Piccolo clashing with and surviving this 910 power level also shows that the statements of Piccolo being exponentially, or multiple times greater than King Piccolo, are no exaggeration. So Piccolo should actually be multiple times above moon level with the scaling lines we had before. And this is actually reinforced in the Saiyan Saga, which I'll get into at the start of the next arc. Should also be noted that after they both launch and tank these 910 level attacks, that Goku's stamina doesn't seem to have wavered. And Piccolo still fights him almost as normal. Kami then admits he can't even see Goku and Piccolo fighting anymore, which is insane. And if you consider the fact that Kami has far-seeing arts and monitors everything on the planet from lightning blast, laser beams, and so forth, it's actually quite an incredible statement. Some Daizenshu scans even have certain Kamis administer larger sections of galaxies than just a planet, but that's a totally different discussion. Junior also possesses the power to grow really huge, which apparently doesn't decrease his speed whatsoever but doesn't change his durability. In Superhero, it's implied it might increase his actual physical strength a bit though, but Piccolo doesn't really seem too impressed or keen to use it really, even after this Goku beatdown. The only other person that really uses it is Lord Slug in a movie, and he seems to think it makes him at least a little bit stronger, but it is a movie. My Chapter 189, Goku and Piccolo are about at half power, and even now Piccolo says that if 100 of Tien, Roshi, Krillin, Yamcha, and Akami jumped him, that they'd still stand no chance of beating him, which everyone actually agrees to. This half power above all of the Z Fighter statement makes a lot more sense with that 910 Super Kamehameha power level than it would if you think that Piccolo is no more than a power level of like 400 as obviously all the Z Fighters and Kami should be above 200. Especially if you think that the power levels are linear. However, if you don't, then it doesn't really matter at this point. Also, while at half power, Piccolo states his power has multiplied once again since they last fought as King Piccolo, which Goku agrees they've grown stronger. This is when Piccolo powers up his final gamble trump card attack, which Goku says he's never felt power like this ever before, which is insane considering they just had this clash earlier with the Super Kamehameha, and then Piccolo apparently just earlier was punching at half power, so maybe he's been saving up some strength. 
This super explosive wave Piccolo launches then nukes all of Papaya Island, and this island in Daisenshu is confirmed to be as big as a small continent. It should be noted that there are still some mountains on the island and stuff in the distance, but it is a huge radius and seems to be Piccolo's subconscious attempt at launching Goku off of the ring more than actually killing him. Despite this power being greater than anything he's ever felt, Goku just tanks it and doesn't fall out of the ring, but the ring is definitely toast. And at this point, Junior is completely fried of Ki and has nothing left. But even he can still survive one of the craziest beatdowns in fiction, which is actually so crazy they actually gave it a name in every single piece of media and video game, which is called the Meteor Combination from Sun. And after taking this combo that was so crazy it gets an actual name, he then can fend off an entire platoon of dudes that can beat down Moonbusters with a single wave of his hand, while having pretty much nothing in the tank left. It's actually kind of ridiculous. Junior once again after this thinks he can atomize Goku after catching him lacking and putting a hole in his chest and killing him to the point that Shenron can't even revive him. And I don't know how substantiated that is, but I guess if anybody knew, it'd be Piccolo. Unfortunately, somehow, Goku while flying around completely crippled with no use of his limbs, just unga boongas and slams his head into Piccolo so hard it puts him into a coma when that gang of Moonbusters still gonna do anything. That's Dragon Ball for you. Where Goku's biggest op was a three-year-old that literally came out of the womb to beat him in a fight, which finally confirmed the son Goku really was the strongest in the world. In terms of power scaling original Dragon Ball, it sort of rode in Master Roshi's backpack to keep them all moon level at the top tiers, with them eventually being able to jump onto Kami's back a little bit later. But with the Saiyan Saga, we finally move beyond that into higher tiers of power. Five years later, Piccolo has been training and honing his techniques for his rematch against Son Goku, but never seems to build up the utmost confidence in just confronting him, or perhaps the inner desire to. However, he has grown a lot more powerful despite mainly focusing on techniques, thanks to his confirmed weighted training regimen now. It wouldn't be far-fetched to say, though, he probably didn't think Goku would allow him to use some of his techniques, sort of like Tien sort of doubting the assurance of the Tri-Beam, even being able to land on Goku. And in Piccolo's case, it wouldn't be surprising if he just thought, wouldn't Goku just punch me in the face while I'm charging this thing? Then grumbled on his mountain and trained a bit more. While probably grumbling about said thing on his mountain, Toriyama decided to say, how do we really get much stronger than the God of Earth and Goku being pretty much able to defeat the Dragon Ball Devil. Ah, I know. Aliens. So, said eventual alien super fighter appears in the form of Raditz. Piccolo blasts Raditz with all his might to the point it exhausts him, and Raditz just jokes about how Piccolo might have singed some of his leg hairs. This is how we know we're reaching the next step in the story, and eventually Goku 2 gets folded by Raditz and he has to team up with Piccolo. Goku makes a challenge to see if Piccolo can fly as fast as his Nimbus Cloud, and considering the Nimbus is debatably only able to fly at a few Mach at best in terms of speed, this is either Goku probably seeing if Piccolo can even fly in terms of travel like that, or is some type of insult. Still funny either way, and Goku's reaction after seems to be that it was just a light-hearted remark. When they reach Raditz, they take off their weighted clothes, and the weights Piccolo weighs right now are pretty unknown, and in the previous arc, Goku was wearing over 200 pounds of weighted clothes. But as we know from future arcs, Piccolo's weights just increase more and more the higher his power level gets, but they should be at least over 200 pounds here. Anyway, this reveals that they actually have power levels of 416 for Goku and 408 for Piccolo, implying Goku is either stronger or Piccolo is better at suppressing his ki. The reason I say this is there is some debate of whether or not this is their actual max power level, and the power they show when using actual key blasts, and they can't chill with their presence is more akin to their real levels of strength. Vegeta seems to make this comment as well later, just based off this encounter with Raditz here, implying it is probably the case. Being close to almost 900 and struggling with Raditz might make a bit more sense if Raditz, while rusty or not in his stride, is at 1200. But then again, Raditz was a bit shook up when he saw Gohan even get over a level of 700 in his pod, although you can say that's just because Gohan is a child, which is implied later, and he never really deduces that their punches are way higher than a level of 400 fighter should be. Speaking of Raditz, yeah, his power level, it's a funny thing. Nappa thinks it's 1200 with some guys saying he's equal to a Cyberman, 
who are all also 1200. But then Toriyama and the Daisenshu says at full power it's 1500. And with a fun fact, there's actually a Broly promotional card that says it's 1600 even. My apologetics for Raditz here tend to be normally he's at 1200, but he reaches about 1500 as he warms up and gets into fights. And Raditz even implies he's going to up the level of his attacks as time goes on after he blitzes Goku and Piccolo at the start of their fight. And Goku's power level with a Kamehameha seems to be 924 now, which isn't that much greater than the 910 Super Kamehameha during the 23rd Budokai, but he can bend it now. It might be better if you think he just shot a normal one that is more powerful than his old Super variant. Should be noted as well that it does seem like Piccolo is slightly weaker than Goku here, which is no surprise as when Raditz launches a double Sunday at him, Piccolo loses an arm and Goku doesn't. The only copium you can really make for Piccolo here is if you imply he was actually faster than Goku, and because he got closer to Raditz, it was harder to dodge the blast, but that is doing some insane tricks on it. Junior can now charge his power level to 1330 with the new special beam cannon, which can apparently blast right through Raditz, despite Raditz being able to tank blast that would easily vaporize the moon multiple times over before with no effort. In Raditz credit though, he does avoid it, but Piccolo vaporizes right through his armor, and Raditz is bleeding. This is when Gohan gets enraged with a power level of 1300 107 and slams right into Raditz, damaging him pretty heavily. Considering that Goku's brother can survive this without being crippled like Piccolo was in the 23rd Budokai at the ending, it might be safe to say his power has been raising a bit even since he dodged the special beam cannon already. Speaking of Raditz suppressing himself, Gohan's power level drops to 1 and Raditz just slaps him away, implying Raditz can suppress his slap to a power level that won't one-shot a kid over 5 times weaker than a random fat farmer or Gohan with a power level of 1 just has insane durability still. Even funnier, Raditz implies he wants to kill Gohan right away after this too, so eventually Goku full Nelson's Raditz from behind and the special beam cannon from Piccolo can blast through Raditz and Goku at the same time, making Piccolo not only the first person to ever kill Goku, but also the first not main character to beat the big bad guy and Goku's brother, and also the first person to kill Goku and the main bad guy at the same time, and the guy who killed both of Bardock's kids that might have had a Shenron wish giving them plot armor their entire lives at the same time. Honestly, a pretty huge W for Piccolo. If he was still the Demon King, I'm sure he'd be living this up. You can probably imagine how insane this would have been to see back in the day when it was coming out weekly. With that, Raditz says, hey, stronger bad aliens are coming. I still win, and Piccolo finishes him off. Bardock would probably mauled seeing this encounter. So much for that Superman and dramatic space pod goodbye and minus. I'm assuming since Raditz and Goku are both grown up for the two ball Shenron wish might have worn off by this point. How crazy for them to both get done it at the same time right after it though. Junior then agrees to train intensely for the Saiyans with the new super prodigy Gohan, the new son of his literal worst enemy that killed his dad. Also, incredibly insane. Toriyama is writing some straight bangers back to back in this arc, and Piccolo is arguably even more evil and egotistical than most people in Shonen just based on his nature alone. At the beginning of the training Piccolo does for the Saiyan arc, all we know for sure is that he can throw Gohan so hard that he can splatter him into jelly, despite taking a pimp slap from injured Raditz with a power level of 1 somehow earlier. Piccolo with weights also has a power level recorded by Bulma here to be 329. When Raditz scanned him at the start, he had a level of 322, meaning Piccolo has gone up a whole 7 points of power from fighting Raditz and just meditating for like a day. Also, as a minor spoiler, Piccolo's power level at max, after training for the Saiyans, reaches 3500. If we consider that he gets around 7 points stronger per day, and it takes Nappa and Vegeta to get to Earth in a year, Piccolo with just this meditation strategy would have gotten over 2500 points stronger. So considering that, and the fact his training just gets more advanced and intense, it's kind of weirdly accurate that he would get 7 power level points stronger after Raditz and a day of training. Just thought that was an interesting detail. It should be noted that the Saiyans do show up earlier than they were supposed to, but Piccolo also says he hasn't really caught up with his training when that 7 power level number difference was stated. By episode 9 of the DBZ anime and chapter 14 of the DBZ manga on Viz, Piccolo does his iconic moon busting feat, and everything that applies to this feat would be relevant to the 329 level Bulma says in the next chapter, as this actually happens earlier. Once again, it depends if you think that Piccolo is suppressed 
impressed when he's in his 300 to 400 stages, but if not, this is further evidence he surpassed Moon Level multiple times, even in OG Dragon Ball, as is implied. Some people have calculated this hyper-violent moon explosion as requiring enough power to actually destroy a small planet, shooting the blast of the moon in only a few seconds, with said debris from the moon's violet explosion reaching Earth in a matter of seconds in return. It's actually far more impressive than simply breaking the moon beyond its gravitational binding energy, where if you were to split some parts off, it doesn't just reform. Due to the massive debris, some would say this attack from Piccolo could destroy some large planets, as causing the moon to shatter at pretty much relativistic to light speed requires an unfathomable amount of energy. Remember when calculating the speeds of the moon that the reaction we see from the moon glowing and being hit in the anime would be 1.2 seconds delayed or less if you think light travels faster in Dragon Ball than in real life, which we'll, I'll get into later. The moon is confirmed in Dragon Ball to be just as far as it is in real life as it is in DB as well, stated by Toriyama in an interview, making this quite the incredible speed feat and further proofs that their key blasts and attacks are starting to reach our standard for light speed in real life, which would require an attack to reach the moon in 1.2 seconds give or take. Considering Piccolo in just this art gets over 10 times stronger and faster than this weighted form here, he pretty objectively should be that level by the time Nappa and Vegeta show up. Piccolo also does this moon feat because he is scared Uzaru Gohan might actually destroy the entire earth, reinforcing that above moon level segment a bit more too. Although you could say Gohan might just destroy everything on it as well. One thing to note for the manga version of this is that in El Manga Legendario, it is stated a power Power level of 10,000 is required to destroy a planet, but some cope you could say here is that in Dragon Ball, Earth is considered a small planet by King Cold, the guy who used to rule the universe, and El Manga Legendario is just for the manga version of the story, but that does seem a bit disingenuous. I'll leave that up to you guys though, this video is mainly only for educational purposes, not for some huge scholarly debate. One final note to make is that there is a video game called Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, which has some input from Toriyama. We know that other shonen games such as Naruto, Naruto and things like that get input from their authors and doesn't necessarily make the things within it canon. But it was a huge debate at the time because there's a statement which goes over Piccolo destroying the moon and it says he just made the illusion that he destroyed the moon. This is agreed upon by most people to be referring to the anime filler episode where Piccolo actually has to face an Uzaru Gohan because his space pod generates a moon illusion that turns him into an Uzaru and then when he destroys the space pod it just destroys the illusion of the moon. Further proof of this is that obviously when Vegeta comes to Earth, he says, I came here knowing there'd be a full moon in case I needed to wipe out the planet faster. And then when he looks all around, there is actually no moon. It's not just an illusion. So unless Piccolo casted some type of moon concealing illusion or magic that lasts even after his death, it's probably just referring to the space pod filler episode. That is quite interesting though, because it makes you wonder why Vegeta's spaceship also couldn't just make a moon illusion rather rather than him having to make a power ball that nerfs him later. One little weird fact now is that apparently Raditz went to the afterlife and got beat up by Enma which means that Junior's evil demon powers that restrict your ability to have life after death are gone now, which Kami talks about as well. Piccolo also apparently has foresight and can tell he'll die in about a year, either due to Kami's failing body or just actual minor precognition. While we don't get much visuals of Piccolo's training up to this point, in the anime we get to see a little bit into it. By Dragon Ball Z episode 12, we see Tien Shinhan stopping a waterfall with his key, while Piccolo meditates and lifts an entire pyramid into the air far above the ground. The amount of strength required to do this is actually pretty insane. Even if you were to argue the pyramid is like the smallest pyramid of Giza, 637,000 tons or so, Piccolo lifts it into the sky in around 9 seconds, with some calculations putting the amount of strength needed to exceed over 41 billion tons. But in the anime, something more than this happens because Piccolo tries to do this again, but with a bit more oomph puts too much telekinetic power behind it, and the pyramid he's lifting explodes, and so do the others around him. And it creates earthquakes that are seemingly felt all around the continent he is on, causing ravines and chaos that fling Gohan and Tien about, which Piccolo did completely on accident while wearing weights. Meaning Piccolo was messing up this entire country or continent just because he thought too hard. 
Junior's meditation sessions tend to stay quite chaotic as he then creates giant storms and tornadoes around him as well. So what's going on in there? But by episode 15, titled Dueling Piccolos, his training evolves once again as the narrator says the Saiyans are the strongest in the universe, which is consistent if you just assume Broly is just chilling at Boo Saga's strength, give or take now, on some random planet in the middle of nowhere. And the Toei staff definitely thought of all that when they wrote that statement. We see in this episode, Majunior has learned the doppelganger technique and can split himself and fight himself to train physically. There are rumors in the Dragon Ball anime special that this may have actually been Toriyama's idea. In his face-off against himself, we can see he can bend Key Blast pretty much 90 degrees with no effort, and Piccolo pulls a Luffy and dodges Piccolo's death beam from himself just by tilting his head slightly. It is kind of absurdly hard for no reason. Like, you're just fighting yourself, why are you doing all of that? But we also see that despite being split and probably half power, that Piccolo can fire off special beam cannons mid-fight now after creating some diversions, which his other half barely avoids, and they're both still wearing weights. Then the other Piccolo, barely having survived it, then edge poses against the cliff after we seeing he survived. Once again, for zero reason. Why is he doing all of that? These two continue to go at it, and all the way from the day to the night with almost zero fatigue, even after launching special beam cannons and edge posing and everything. I guess Piccolo has gotten a lot stronger by now with 8 months remaining until the Saiyans do arrive. With the 118 days remaining, Gohan is able to make weighted Piccolo sweat in a fight, which is pretty impressive considering what we saw from the Shadow Clone fight. And with that, there's not much else to say, and we are introduced to Nappa and Vegeta at last. Before we fight them, the Saiyans summon some lackeys so the Z Fighters can show how good their training is before they get inevitably steamrolled by the main villains. Each of these Cybermen that are summoned, Nappa says, are equal to Raditz and have power levels of 1200. Nappa also thinks that Raditz got caught off guard by relying on his scouter too much, and Vegeta then makes a pretty insane remark about how Namekians like Piccolo are slimy gastropod guys that possess strange powers beyond their extraordinary fighting abilities, including sorcery. Gohan, Piccolo, and Krillin also stack up before this with the suppressed power levels of 981, 1220, and 1083 which Vegeta says is nonsense. They can simply raise their power like they did against Raditz, with Piccolo's real power at this point being 3,500, which actually makes him equal to King Kai, who is the strongest in Otherworld at this point in the story. So let's just assume the Otherworld fighters and Grand Kai just sucked right now for no reason. This allows Piccolo to punch a Cyberman and just mouth blast it into Atoms, despite it being the level Raditz usually is at when he fought Goku and Piccolo earlier showing he can just sort of fodderize a guy who can tank Key Blast that can vaporize the moon at relativistic to light speeds. With a power level 4000, Nappa is completely immune to Chaozu's paralysis ability and can punch Tien, a guy with a power level 1830, so hard his arm is ripped right off his body. While this happens, Piccolo can see this attack coming and tells Tien to duck, but Piccolo is a way higher level of fighter than him, and Tien can't. Chaozu also tries self-destructing, which does pretty much nothing, but it does put a few scruffs on Nappa's armor and body. Chaozu, by the way, apparently has a power level of 610 at this point, which is pretty awful, all things considered. Piccolo immediately deduces that Nappa lowers his guard for an instant when he attacks, and alongside Krillin, uses this to damage Nappa as he tries to come and finish Tien Shinhan off. While Piccolo draws blood, and Krillin can slam him down, their plan crumbles when Gohan gets too scared to follow up. But this does irritate Nappa, and Vegeta also calls it a good plan. Nappa's mouth bleeding here can only be from Piccolo, since that's where Piccolo attacked, and Krillin attacks him over the head. Piccolo also seems to fire some type of special beam cannon Masenko blast here, and Nappa can dodge it. However, this technique is different than a fully charged special beam cannon, as you have all probably gathered. Tien also, with one hand, uses the spirit tri-beam, which is what it's called in the video games, and puts his whole life into it, which engulfs Nappa and rips his armor and body up a bit, which even Piccolo can't believe he could survive. Meaning the spirit tri-beam shot Tien's power above 3500 here, which makes you wonder what it could have done in original Dragon Ball. So maybe he wasn't lying when he said, eh, maybe I shouldn't use this on you in this tournament, Goku. After this, they all hatch a plan to grab Nappa's tail, which doesn't do anything since he trains his, and Piccolo gets KO'd by getting elbowed in the head, basically making him get one shot since they just had a three-hour break. 
Apparently Nappa even went easy on him because he just needs to get information about the Dragon Balls. After this, Krillin goes absolutely sicko mode and would have 1v1 Nappa actually if it weren't for Vegeta just by having like under half the power level. With Piccolo blasting Nappa from behind and causing him more pain than Chaozu's self-destructor, Gohan gets a rage buff and kicks Nappa away. Nappa launches a bomber DX at Gohan and Piccolo tanks it for him. Considering Nappa's power level 4000 might have been him when he wasn't serious earlier and he's more angry and serious now, I suppose Piccolo's body not being vaporized by Nappa's DX is actually pretty impressive, allowing it to take all the energy for Gohan. However, this is where both Kami and Piccolo finally meet their end, as Piccolo surpasses Kami for the first time as a good person. And the Dragon Balls turn to stone, Gohan gets enraged and gets a power level of 2800, and eventually even higher later against Vegeta. However, in the end, Goku and friends defeat the Saiyans and send them on the way. And with nothing left to say for Piccolo, however, he gets quite the spotlight in the next two arcs as we go to his homeworld, Namek. The Namek Saga for Piccolo is obviously a lot different than for Goku and other heroes because, well, he is dead. However, there are still some interesting buildups in terms of the lore for Namekians as well as some anime only training for Piccolo we see happen during this time while he is in the afterlife and how it actually applies to his eventual showdown against Frieza. At the start we learn that there was a huge cataclysm that took out pretty much every Namekian and there are rumored to be only around a hundred left which I suppose really makes that Vegeta village moment a whole lot worse. And these Namekians which we learned by chapter 59 can have power Power levels ranging from 3,000 to 10,000 for some higher level warriors, meaning during the Saiyan Saga, Piccolo was sort of just a tad stronger than the Namekian warriors we see get folded by Dodoya, but way, way weaker than the ones that Frieza sort of blows away in the anime, and I'm not joking, he just breathes on them and they just fucking die. So all things considered, Piccolo will have a lot of ground to cover to fight this Frieza guy. In the anime, we see that even Chaozu arrives to King Kai's faster than Goku did in the Saiyan Saga alongside all the others, so maybe Chaozu's 610 power level really was higher than Raditz fight Goku's normal or weighted state, and it wasn't just a weird cap suppressed level that didn't represent his maximum. Anyway, King Kai tells all of them to catch bubbles, and Piccolo with waste does it instantly while it takes everyone else a ton of time. Piccolo is actually as strong as King Kai at max here, but King Kai might have strange otherworld hacks we might not know of. For instance, like how King Emma can sort of neg people to the other world irregardless of how strong they are depending on how evil they are. It wouldn't be shocking if King Kai possessed a similar BFR ability and this sort of implies when Piccolo gets angry and grabs King Kai but then seems to regret it. This could be either he senses he's about to get BFO'd off the planet or he realizes he's just being a prick. Pick your lane. King Kai also accepts Piccolo as a student because Junior used the word under three times in a sentence. I guess it's not really that hard. Later King Kai also really seems very confident while eyeing down Raccoon, despite his power level being around 40,000 and King Kai's being only 3,500. While Piccolo sort of does this meditation training in the background, which King Kai calls napping, the others try to catch bubbles. And during this, Tien is wielding a giant mallet and is running faster than everyone else. One interesting detail I noticed during this though that I never really get seen talk about is that Tien slams the ground so hard with this mallet, it actually shakes King Kai planet numerous times. This planet has 10 times the gravity of Earth, and if you take that literally, Tien is sending a shockwave through a ball with over 10 times the density or mass of the entire planet Earth. Considering everyone hyped up Goku punching through this planet in Battle of Gods as a Super Saiyan 3, this makes that whole discussion kind of funny. You could obviously say that the afterlife has some different laws of physics than normal and is even considered a different type of reality, but that is just what happens and what we know of. This is important for Piccolo as we'll get into in a bit. By episode 55, this is where Piccolo does that grabbing King Kai scene, but he also wants King Kai to teach him his techniques. This is a great copium statement for people that wanted anybody else but Goku to use Kaioken, but it seems as though they don't actually train there long enough to learn it despite their insane strength gains they do get. Maybe King Kai regretted teaching it to Goku after he immediately tried to take it to the limit and almost imploded numerous times fighting super powerful aliens. Although with Piccolo, this technique would have been 
been really good considering his regeneration really amps him to absurd levels later. Kind of a missed opportunity. I guess as a fun fact here, King Kai apparently once took cooking classes, which is why everyone loves his food, including the Ginyu Force, and he was apparently so good at it that his teacher thought he'd make a great husband one day, which is kind of silly considering these Kais are sort of just like plant people that grow on trees somehow and somewhere. Eventually they all catch bubbles and Piccolo is still scared of someone who is stronger than Vegeta, so I guess they all still suck pretty bad. But then as we get to Gregory, we learn that the weakling trio actually managed to beat him in about an hour, including Chiaotzu. And after learning this, Piccolo thinks he can take 10 of them still, which is actually quite the downgrade from the 23rd Budokai, where he apparently said he could take over 100 of them. So he gives it five seconds to beat them and they basically jump him while he's still wearing weights. All we know is that Tien and Yamcho can react to Piccolo and Chiaotzu can zap him, who Piccolo basically kills in one swing of his arm by slamming him head first into the ground. But you can't really die when you're dead, so he just gets back up. However, Piccolo is impressed, and eventually the three of them beat weighted Piccolo, and this is a really cool scene where Tien and Yamcha actually want Piccolo to take his weights off, showing they actually respect his true ability, and don't just want to take some opportunity to beat his ass to bump up their egos. You start to get a real feel for everyone when you see how honest and hardworking they are in the background when they train, while Piccolo is just being grumpy about it. By episode 58, Piccolo still isn't training like everyone else, but they know how strong he is later, so maybe he just sort of mixes it up more than they do. King Kai then makes a statement that the Ginyu Force possesses five members that are stronger than Goku, who has been training in high gravity and is trying to master 100 Gs, or 100 times Earth's gravity, and is about two to three days before he arrives, and this is significant as King Kai can actually watch Goku, and it leads into another scene. This scene in episode 50 is when Goku only had been facing 20 Gs of gravity in his training, and we know that Goku's ship based off a of Saiyan space pod can travel to Namek in around six days. And if you look at the Dragon Ball universe map, he's basically clearing about half the universe in terms of length or a massive section of a quarter of the universe, depending on how you think the map is actually structured or laid out. And during this episode, he dodges meteors flying towards him while he travels the universe at much faster than light speeds, which some have calculated these meteors to flying from anywhere from a few hundred to a few million times the speed of light, depending on who you ask. It can be considered unquantifiable as well if you consider the meteors to be flying in the same direction as the ship though, and we just don't know how fast the meteors are flying alongside the ship, but that does seem a little copium. This scales to Piccolo as everyone on King Kai's scales to the Ginyu Force and eventually can actually low diff them by the end of their training around episode 92 with Piccolo even much more so, which I'll get into soon. In episode 63, we see Piccolo can actually sense things from King Kai's planet happening on Namek, meaning he can basically focus and sense things happening across the universe in a different space-time continuum and dimension entirely, which is actually a pretty crazy feat for him here. Since this is an educational type video, and not me trying to be a debate sophist, I also feel it's necessary to include the point that the afterlife in Dragon Ball is currently debated about heavily in terms of its nature, and since Piccolo and the others are interacting with things there and so on, there are some guidebooks that say the afterlife resides in a higher realm or dimension than the living universe, and for some they take this to mean a higher mathematical realm, and for others they just mean that it's literally locationally placed above the living universe. There's also some that will argue Koyama, the screenwriter for Dragon Ball Z's anime and many of the movies, said that the Dragon Ball universe has higher dimensions, but this Koyama account is kind of dubious as well as the fact that he sometimes argues dimensionality as something spiritual rather than mathematical, with some people trying to ask him questions over and over or bully him into saying certain things, irregardless of his initial statements to fit their agendas. And I honestly don't take it very serious, but it is something that unfortunately did and does happen. And hopefully in the future, people leave him alone and be more respectful. And I actually think that not valuing these statements will help people leave him alone. Some also think the afterlife in Dragon Ball has no time as well, meaning that every character sort of is moving in a realm without time, with the living universe often being called the temporal realm, and this is also quite debated about, with some arguing the afterlife just has a different flow of time. That is something to consider as well. So yeah, with that, it's possible to argue that even by the time Raditz appears, these guys are just infinite speed, higher dimensional entities, which... Let's be real, probably not the case, 
But hey, I'm not here to debate in this video. Also, in terms of this, there is an argument that the first Dragon Ball Z movie, Dead Zone, is actually canon to the Dragon Ball Z anime. But I'll get into that when we get to it in the Garlic Jr. saga a bit after this arc. As the last little close off to this anime only introduction, yeah, I know it's a lot of anime, but remember, Piccolo is dead in the manga, is that in episode 92, when the Ginyu Force faces Tien, Yamcha, and Chaozu, it is apparently stated that Captain Ginyu once told the Ginyu Force to always tell test their powers to make sure they actually work the same whenever they come to a new planet, which is a pretty surprisingly cool statement considering how nonchalant and uncoordinated and unprofessional they seemed at times during their actual fight on Namek. We then learned that all their powers do work exactly the same. It's important to note that Chaozu here also can apparently fold Guldo pretty easily who can use all his powers, yet Chaozu sort of is considered too weak to help with anyone after the androids later. And if Chaozu can resist time stop or somehow do it himself or overpower it with telekinesis, that is pretty significant, but isn't implied. Chapter 91 of the Dragon Ball Z manga has us finally show Nail versus Frieza, and you'll remember earlier that Frieza could sort of just blow away a bunch of Namekians with power levels of 10,000 each. However, Nail has a level of 42,000, making about as strong as a Ginyu Force member, give or take, with Frieza's being 530,000. Obviously, Nail gets folded, but we do learn here in Chapter 92 that a Namekian's power drops when they regenerate. This is when Piccolo finally is wished back to Namek, with Piccolo confident he can take out Frieza. Nail doesn't actually think Piccolo can, but admits Piccolo has some cracked levels of strength. And on top of this, we'll learn that when Piccolo fuses with Nail, his power will increase many fold. As a power scaler here, I'm sure you guys are also curious as well, how strong is he actually before fusing with Nail? Well, we might actually have a pretty concrete answer, which is kind of satisfying. And in El Manga Legendario, there is a page dedicated to a Piccolo action figure, as there are a lot of pages in this guidebook, funny enough, so don't let it dissuade you, but this one drops a pretty massive bomb, and that states that when Piccolo does merge with Nail, it quintuples his power, or multiplies it by five times. So if you consider that Vegeta during his fight versus first form Frieza has a power level of 250,000 in V-Jump, with Frieza probably using half of his own power, hence why Vegeta was struggling more, which would put Frieza like at 265,000, which kind of makes some sense. If Piccolo senses this Frieza, then he may be stronger than this, however it's implied he doesn't sense or really realize how strong Frieza is until later after his training and after saying he would beat him. And considering second form Frieza has a power level of over 1 million, confirmed both by guides and Frieza's statement, Piccolo had a power level of probably over 200,000 when wearing his weights before fusing with Nail, making him even stronger than the Kaioken 100 gravity times training Goku, who had a power level of 180,000. That makes Captain Ginyu his pants and wonder if Goku is a Super Saiyan. This is all before Piccolo is even 10 years old and with multitudes of less training and time spent with King Kai and so on. Eventually Piccolo does face down against second form Frieza and despite him having a level of 1 million, Piccolo overpowers him quite technically in one of the coolest fights in the entire series and the significance is of course fighting Frieza is a pretty big buff to your scaling because Frieza does a lot of crazy shit. In his first form, while probably hyper casual with one finger, Frieza blew up planet Vegeta and destroyed every single Saiyan in existence. A planet with 10 times the gravity of Earth in a similar fashion as Piccolo vaporizing the moon, except obviously on a way more massive, large planetary scale, with some calculating the energy needed to hyper violently blow up a planet with 10 times the mass of Earth, not just beyond its GBE, but send it scattering across the cosmos as being big enough to destroy dwarf stars and sometimes smaller stars. But here's Piccolo taking him on in his transform state while actually trying, sweating, and so on, while Junior has a big cheesy grin on his face. We learn later that Go Goku and Frieza with power levels of 60 through 150 million can blow up Namek into such a huge supernova like Flash that its explosion is actually visible from the entire galaxy. The power levels from 3 million to 120 million are also linear unlike a lot of the early power levels in the series, as Goku with a Kaioken which directly just doubles or multiplies your key by whatever level of Kaioken you use brings him to that same power level. So example, Goku with Kaioken times 10 brings him to 30 million if his base has a level of 3 million. Frieza using half his power brings him to 60 million, and his max is 120 million, etc. So it might be safe to say Piccolo is capable of almost 1% or so of what Super Saiyan Goku is, give or take. And they do make this galaxy engulfing 
supernova-like light. The only issue with this light in the anime is, like I said, it might be cinematic, as nothing in the galaxy seems to be actually be destroyed by it, and it was from a suppressed Frieza who just wanted to fight Super Saiyan Goku. One last little statement that does apply to Piccolo is that apparently second form Frieza has enough power to destroy the universe, in King Kai's opinion. Whether that means Frieza could just systematically destroy anything in the universe, or could just conquer it all, is debatable. Although I'm sure those afterlife scalers will just tell you he'd just blink and the whole universe would just vanish or something. Joking. This all would apply to Piccolo, who can fold this guy pretty confidently. Meaning in King Kai's opinion, Piccolo can probably do the same. If this does mean he can just destroy whatever he pleases, rather than one-shot the universe, it could imply that Piccolo can blow away even the most massive of stars or planets and so forth, which wouldn't be that crazy considering the next arcs. The last thing Piccolo does before getting Axe in this arc is he gets a key bump from Gohan and Krillin, with Gohan's power level fluctuating from second form Frieza, or higher depending on his anger, and Krillin's being somewhere above 75,000 at this point. With this, he can kick final form Frieza in the face, who might be at 30% using the anime, or even 50% and launch him away in pain, but he can only do it in one brief flash before he loses all his hype and just gets beat up. That being said though, that's it for Piccolo during this arc, other than stepping up to Vegeta after Frieza is defeated, and Vegeta actually listens to him and leaves Gohan alone in a very iconic Vegeta moment. With that, we move on to Garlic Jr. and the Android Cell Sagas, which are pretty huge for our green buddy here. Since I didn't include this in the Frieza Saga portion, Guru in the anime comments on how the Dragon Balls actually followed them all to Earth from Namek before Super Saiyan Goku and Frieza could even finish fighting in like five minutes, meaning these Dragon Balls just zipped across half the universe in a few minutes or hours or whenever you think they started. In OG Dragon Ball, Goku once caught the Earth's Dragon Balls flying and scattering about, so if you think that this is something similar, it might be possible to scale it to Guru somehow and even Elder Mori later, but I don't think it's a strong or convincing line of scaling speed. It's even much, much worse if you think the Dragon Ball universe is truly infinite in size, making these balls just zip at infinite speed, but by that point, what isn't infinite speed in this show if you accept that? A fun fact from this part too, is that in the anime, we see Piccolo reminisce on Goku and how good of a guy he is, and one of these memories he has is Kid Goku just blasting a hole in him when he was the Demon King, showing once again, oh yeah, Piccolo really is that crazy evil old guy from back in the day. Before we see the return of Goku from Yardrat, we get a mini arc that isn't in the manga, which is the return of Garlic Jr. This arc references the first Dragon Ball Z movie, Dead Zone, and basically makes it canon to the anime continuity. The significance of this is that the Dead Zone has some wonky interpretations and scaling that you can use, and the anime version gives us some neat details for Piccolo's growth with training that's not in the manga. In the movie, Goku, Piccolo, and Gohan, before the arrival of Raditz, face off against an immortal Garlic Jr. who summons a black void called the Dead Zone. This feat is pretty contentious for a few reasons due to its multiple interpretations. So I'll go over just what summoning the Dead Zone can mean and let you guys decide. This attack is described in multiple volumes of the Daizenshu as many things. Some say it's a type of black hole where no light can escape. Another iteration can be translated as it saying hyperspace or time space, which means having more than three dimensions and so forth. You could also say that it's just the hole itself he makes that has this quality, but Garlic Jr. and the Daizenshu also seem to imply he just straight up made it. If you think, if you take this to its utmost, Garlic Jr. made a type of time space or hyperspace before Raditz even appears. Maybe those afterlife super apologists were onto something, right? Well, this is dubious for a few reasons. And the counter here is that for the same reason entering hyperspace doesn't make you insane and say something like Star Wars or any other science fiction. Because hyperspace in fiction, especially science fiction, can oftentimes mean a notional space-time continuum in which it is possible to travel faster than light. It could also just mean that it has three spatial dimensions and a fourth temporal one, which is a common statement in a lot of battle shonens. However, it should be noted that not even light can escape the vacuum of the dead zone, so should we equate it to a black hole in terms of strength? Well, it's not necessarily impossible. I think a pretty important takeaway I'd have, though, is these guides and the series like to reference a power level of 10,000 as needed to destroy a planet. 
not 10,000 needed to destroy an infinite 3D universe. And Tian Shinhan's mallet on King Kai's planet being five mathematical dimensions in strength that would nuke 83 million 40 universes from existence because it shook that planet. When King Kai made a comment about Frieza being able to destroy the universe, what was he on? These Cybermen could totally do it too, right? You're joking aside, that gets into debate territory. So what do you guys think? Do you think it's referring to the science fiction definition or the mathematical one? Let me know. Before Garlic returns, the other junior is shown training again, but now he makes three doppelgangers instead of just one, and has all three of them jump himself. Showing his immense level of skill he will probably need in just a moment, and one interesting detail that's shown is that despite dividing his strength, they can all easily launch special beam cannons, which he can seem to negate or just deflect with a type of small explosive wave around his body, showing a high level defensive technique that we honestly got to see more of in the future. It's a pretty cool concept considering just how overpowered the special beam cannon gets later. But from here, there is a whole dramatic portion where Garlic invades Kami's lookout and seals Popo away and Kami. But interestingly, Kami puts up a pretty decent fight against this new super amped Makio star Garlic Jr. that could apparently brute force just bust out of his own dead zone with his own goons. Garlic also says that Popo has great power that he can seal away with his technique now. So it's possible that Popo and Kami are just sort of stronger now. And the anime does do this a lot with a lot of the side cast. Kind of like how Roshi just sort of sucked at the start of Z and then gets a lot of gains by Super as he gets, I don't know, fed up after the Boo Saga. We see this with Popo momentarily scrapping with Goten and Trunks in the Boo Saga. But one thing you could, and I mean could, say for Kami, is that Kami's power is sort of linked a bit to Piccolo. Like, not completely, but kind of. So, when Piccolo gets Giga Super Turbo buffed, Kami might benefit slightly, too. This is also shown in the inverse, as when Kami is sealed, Piccolo actually can't use his powers that well, apparently. But this seems a bit suspicious, and Kami seems to take it more as, like, bro talk, implying it might have been that he wanted to make sure Kami wasn't damaged by him going all out. It would also be kind of weird if sealing Kami just nerfed Piccolo as Piccolo kind of just ate Kami in a bottle during the 23rd Budokai. So maybe Garlic Jr. in base just kind of sucks or is suppressed. Up to you guys. The Makio Star also amps them way further as it gets closer and Kami doesn't face the stronger version so you guys decide. Piccolo also shows resistance to being corrupted by evil demon-like poison mist unlike the Ginyu Force level human Z fighters, and he shows some type of purifying ability or healing ability. It should be noted that Piccolo has a few traits from Nail now that Dende notes, so there's some weird Namekian Seiji things that he is probably capable of since Nail was basically the top guy from Namek. Piccolo also shows some good intelligence here and pretty much fools everyone that he is under the influence of Garlic's evil water, just so he can get closer and see what's going on and look for a cure. Garlic Jr. gets amped several dozens of times past this, and Piccolo can pretty confidently beat him up until Garlic gets turbo giga amped by the Machia Star basically, almost physically touching Earth. And this doesn't really mean much in terms of scaling since Piccolo should be stronger than Garlic from the first movie. That would have all the crazy power scaling implications to begin with anyway. But one of Garlic's four monarchs can catch Destructo Disc from Krillin and throw them back. So Piccolo should theoretically be able to do something like that too. An interesting line here from Piccolo is that when Garlic tries to power up and get massive, Piccolo drops the line, your larger scale certainly bestows its own kind of power up. However, in exchange, you lose some of your edge on speed. There's no longer any way you can win. Showing that Piccolo is more combat aware than future Trunks is even at this point, when he is less than 10 years old and before fusing with Kami. But he does have King Piccolo knowledge and Nails knowledge now, so his actual fight age and experience might be pretty insane. Possibly a few hundred years worth. Might be kind of funny if this is where Cell also gets this knowledge and experience from. However, eventually though, while Kami is messing about in Kami land, Piccolo's powers start to be affected by Kami's own failures and weakening. So Garlic just tries to hold out with his immortality and almost infinite energy reserves he's absorbing from the Makio Star while Piccolo gives him one of the craziest beatdown I've ever seen in a show. Seriously. So Gohan has to step in and go unquantifiable rage amp mode, and then blows up the entire Makio star and sends Garlic Jr. back to his totally 
fourth dimensional and not just science fiction term black hole for good this time and saves the day. Hooray. From here, we get to do the actual Android saga in the manga. The looming threat of Frieza revived as Mecha Frieza comes, but now he is alongside his super giga powerful dad as well, King Cold. And during the waiting period for the Earth's doom, Vegeta gives Piccolo his first real accolades and say he is a real warrior after Piccolo suppresses his key before anybody even knew he was there. With that, the typical Mecha Frieza and Cold versus Super Saiyan Trunks encounter happens, but one little detail I wanted to bring up was that Frieza says he is the strongest in the universe right in front of King Cold, and King Cold doesn't actually comment on it at all. However, Frieza is stronger and Cold can apparently help fight Super Saiyan Goku and not just get one shot or something. Even on Namek, the whole point of them fighting Goku versus Frieza was for Frieza's ego as the strongest in the universe as well. I don't think he'd really care about that title as much if King Cold would just transform and one-shot him or something, although I'm sure he'd still be egotistical about losing to a Saiyan. After Trunks does one of the coldest no diffs in fiction, we learn that Piccolo has been training pretty intensively every day even now in the manga, which was just shown in the Garlic Jr. saga. Piccolo also says he didn't go with the other Namekians to their planet because he wanted a more chaotic and fun life, and speaking of that, during the one or two year-ish time skip between Frieza's defeat and Goku's return from Yardrath, apparently the Namekians wish to be transported to a new planet. So. Did they create this planet with Elder Mori, who was weaker than warrior Namekians before with power levels of 3000? Did Mori get a buff from Elder Guru? Did they just get transported to an actual random planet, then terraform it to be like Namek? Was it always just like Namek and they decided it was theirs now? You decide. Another note too is that Yamcha notes that when Super Saiyan Goku is staring down Trunks, that he has an insane power level despite not fighting further reinforcing that it's just normal earthling fighting repertoire to just sit at a casual level when you aren't initiating an attack, even in confrontation. This could apply to all of Piccolo's readings earlier in the series, as I've already said many times, and Super Saiyan Goku also blocks Super Saiyan Trunks' sword slashes he killed Frieza with with one finger. And this is important later for obvious reasons, although Goku says Trunks didn't go all out on him. Interesting detail here is that Piccolo can hear all they are saying from a mile away, and Trunks calls 17 and 18 from his timeline, 19 and 20 in the Viz version here. Either way, Vegeta, Piccolo, and everyone else trained for the worst possibility and to not die to the androids in three years. Junior also says if you don't think you can handle something like that, don't even show up, which is important for his growth from the training as he does show up later. In the manga, we see a brief glimpse of this training as Goku has Piccolo to train with him and Gohan, and he actually has Piccolo sparring against him as a Super Saiyan in some scenes. In the anime, we see Piccolo draw blood from post Yardrat Goku, which is pretty intense considering Goku had trained for a year and was already way stronger than Piccolo even in base against Frieza. So Piccolo's training already paid off from that Garlic Jr. arc. The only other anime stuff here is that Chi-Chi yells at Piccolo and Goku to get their driver's licenses, which Piccolo fearfully obeys for some reason. Probably that nail part of him. Piccolo also comments that the power of Chi-Chi to power Null and silence the strongest in the universe is formidable. Piccolo apparently has a way easier time grasping driving than Goku, if you even care, just by having a completely psycho instructor. Eventually, they save some kids from like a uh, storm and they have to catch a bus and then the drivers and all the instructors are just like hey wait a minute can't you just fly you don't need a license ha 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 and they just let them go and they don't get any licenses but it's implied goku gets it later during the cell saga but i guess we can't officially say piccolo gets a license it's sad Anyway, the android face-off eventually happens after a time skip and we see that Super Saiyan Goku is pretty nerfed by his heart virus and can't put 19 down. However, Tien doesn't see anything wrong with Goku's performance despite sensing them before. However, Piccolo does since he has directly trained with him for a few years. Duro also apparently based his power and calculations on Goku's hypothetical max potential as an adult after seeing the Saiyan Saga fight, which makes you wonder, how did he do that? Did he base it off of how strong Goku got from the Raditz fight to Vegeta in about a year? And by that logic, did he assume Goku got about 20 times stronger a year if he is training hard? Did he really just never check in on him? 
all things sound pretty funky unless Jero completely egoed it and just said, yeah, he probably just gets that much more powerful linearly every year and can multiply his power by maybe 10 times with that Kaioken or something, which I guess makes more sense. But either way, Vegeta has to step in and beat up 19 and Piccolo says that Vegeta is maybe stronger than Goku. 19 also multiplies his strength from absorbing Goku's energy that he probably just couldn't use with his sick body before this, and it's implied the fight with 19 actually drained Vegeta to the point Jiro might be able to beat him if he tried. Jiro also absorbs some key from Super Saiyan Vegeta and even from weighted Piccolo, and Piccolo actually no diffs him completely later. So not only does Piccolo beat Android 20, he beats him while he is amped, and with zero difficulty, which makes the Z fighters shit their pants and compare him to a Super Saiyan. Makes you wonder how strong base Gohan is at this point too, and what that means when he eventually does go Super Saiyan. This makes Piccolo question if the androids weren't as tough as they thought, or they just grew way too strong from their training. We then learn that 17 and 18 have infinite energy, and Trunks isn't convinced that Vegeta can handle them. Piccolo also seems to concede sort of indirectly that Super Saiyan Vegeta and Super Saiyan Goku are stronger than him. Should be obvious, but should also probably be mentioned. However, him being able to take down the entire Frieza force, including Frieza, easily by this point, should be a given. Later, when the real androids appear, 17 doesn't think that 18 can handle everyone in a fight alongside Super Saiyan Vegeta, apparently, after she beats him pretty easily, but it makes Trunks in disbelief how strong he is against androids even stronger than the ones who wiped out his timeline. Vegeta also loses stamina with every move while she does those, so when they do try to help Vegeta from his ass beating and 17 jumps in, all of them get folded pretty easily. During this brawl, Trunks has his sword get snapped by just 18 blocking it and then pretty much one-shotted by 17. When he does try to get back up, 18 slams Vegeta into him and it just knocks him out as collateral, which is pretty pathetic, all things considered. Piccolo, on the other hand, gets roundhoused by 17 just straight up and then gets back up to fight him more in which 17 ducks and almost blows his spine through his body with a Looney Tunes Quack. punch. Showing Super Saiyan Trunks and Piccolo are more relative to each other, but honestly, I gotta say, Piccolo probably got it worse and he was better off. So it's easier to say that Trunks and Piccolo at the bare minimum are more relative to each other than they are to Vegeta, who takes multiple combos and an entire fight to finish off. This is pretty significant for his Kami fusion scaling later, and Tien in the background just kind of gets no diffed. He is still scared of Frieza, no shocker there, but you know, maybe if he pulled out the Neo Tri-Beam, he could have just like ended the, the series just right there. But maybe that's better for a TN video. After they're all spared, Piccolo says they are way stronger than he ever imagined. So way stronger than what he assumed Future Trunks' maximum was and etc., which is pretty consistent with him being sort of relative to Trunks, which is why I think it's actually a good thing to scale him that way. A little fun fact about Manga Piccolo is that you'll notice that his speech bubble patterns are a bit bipolar, whereas villains, aliens, and Super Saiyans tend to have square speech bubbles, with good guys or earthlings tending to have circles or round ones. During this arc, his bubbles fluctuate between more round shapes and sharp shapes, showing his nature becoming better and more earthling-like, whereas before all his boxes were just always sharp and always angular. I always thought that was a cool detail from Toriyama, and it really shows his attention to detail he puts even to small things like that. I wouldn't put too much stock into that though, as his boxes tend to just be square for the rest of the series, as it seems like they just kind of give up on it. But even when Piccolo has tsundere moments or about being called good, he has his boxes become sharp again after just being pretty round, and Tian is like, oh yeah, isn't he Demon King Piccolo? And this question is sort of brought up again when he speaks to Kami later, and Kami seems to differentiate between them and calls King Piccolo his parent and not him, with this leading to Kami saying he has sensed a being stronger than the androids scurrying about for the past four years. Makes you wonder why he didn't say a single thing about it eventually, though. Kami sees Cell going horror movie mode down below and decides to fuse with Piccolo. Kami makes a bit of a distinction with just a normal power-up, though, and that fusing with him will also grant him vast amounts of knowledge, meaning this Piccolo not only gets far, far stronger, but also gains all of Kami's wisdom, experience, and intelligence. This may sort of explain why he's a bit more crafty and a bit more of an intelligent fighter than the others, at least way later in the series. This fusion, if we equate it to something like Nails, 
puts Piccolo way above Super Saiyan Vegeta and the others, even with his weights on. 16 cents is weighted Piccolo and thinks he can rival 17 or 18 in power. He doesn't say the same about Cell, though. So Cell is still probably weaker than even 18 at this point, but probably stronger than pre-fusion Piccolo and Super Saiyan Trunks. So maybe in between. And this sort of justifies at least that same five times multiplier for the fusion, just like Nails before. As Piccolo went from basically getting one shot by a suppressed 17 alongside Super Saiyan Trunks to fighting a full power one at equal strength who was even stronger than 18 who bullied Vegeta who could take multiple attacks from all of them. Even Piccolo fighting Imperfect Cell who was probably a lot stronger than Prefusion Piccolo with weight is pretty good as the weight seemed to suppress him around 25% give or take if you use the Saiyan Saga or the Raditz fight power levels as kind of a basis. If 16 thinks weighted Piccolo can rival 18, then this may further reinforce that 17 is basically an unweighted version of her in terms of strength, and we can see Piccolo just straight up blitzing people or bullying people that could dominate his weighted form. Even worse here is that Cell absorbs an arm from weighted Piccolo, which actually amps Cell. Piccolo then regenerates his arm, which nerfs Piccolo, and can still beat Cell up with weights on showing the gap is even more massive than we thought. Cell also confirms what I was saying earlier, as when he sees future Trunks, he thinks he can just straight up kill him like he did in the anime and isn't even worried about it. And one other comment to make about Cell is that Vegeta may imply Cell is also stronger than him as well by saying the power he felt was stronger than him. This could be either referring to both of them, Piccolo and Cell, or just weighted Piccolo. You guys decide. This whole fiasco of outsmarting Cell is also considered due to Kami's wisdom he gained, which is pretty good considering Cell is pretty intelligent, especially before he gets his massive perfect form ego. However, Piccolo clarifies once he meets Goku again that he's still mainly Piccolo. I also wonder if Piccolo could just do this anyway, and he's just kind of copium crediting Kami, because he kind of does the same thing in Garlic Jr., but Toriyama isn't basing the manga off of the anime from right now. It's more the other way around, with Toriyama kind of helping the anime, but... Piccolo now also is willing to just watch the news to check up on Cell's activity and yell at it like some angry guy at a sports game. It's kind of goofy. Makes you wonder why he doesn't just chill on a lookout and just see everything that's happening. Eventually, 17 and Piccolo start going at it, and Goku actually says he'd just get in the way of him if he tried to help. It's kind of crazy seeing Goku actually becoming a side character and just saying side character things for this whole chunk of the story. We then see Junior use the Hell Zone grenade for the first time, which apparently can stop even 17 from escaping from it, and this technique seems a lot better and more efficient than pretty much all of the key blast spams that you see throughout the series, like Vegeta is mainly known for, or the Vegeta technique. 17 barriers it though, which in Daizenshu you need double the key of an attack to barrier it. So even though Piccolo and 17 have equal power, 17 has infinite stamina and thus can just pour as much energy into a barrier as he needs, whereas Piccolo probably reserves how much power he actually puts into each attack, even if it is at full power, to kind of pace himself. The trade-off of their fight is that Piccolo is the way better fighter, but 17 has equal strength and infinite cardio, pretty much. We also see some foreshadowing of 17 becoming a park ranger, as he asks Piccolo to get away from that island so they don't destroy it, and with that, 17 goes full power. With Piccolo says 17 is really fast, but his punches aren't really that hard, which works in Piccolo's favor since he needs to last as long as possible. However, for a not martial artist, 17 is pretty good at swapping hands with a few hundred years of experience fighting pseudo-god alien slug man, but is also only 12 years old at the same time. There's somewhat of an argument that a year for a Namekian is actually 130 days due to the Namekian Dragon Balls, which would make Piccolo actually closer to Goku in age, so he'd be around like 30-ish around this fight in Namekian years. But for Dragon Ball, we know that's not how it works when it comes to your potential as a fighter. With that, Cell returns and is so powerful he just walks by Piccolo and Piccolo doesn't even move. Krillin says his power has grown exponentially, in fact, which is a huge power scaling buzzword for people. Whether that means Cell has literally multiplied his power by itself, like a Patara fusion or some other weird thing is up for debate as you know, you can debate what exponentially would have to mean. Uh, Piccolo gets hit by this new exponential Cell a few times and then launches an attack called the Light Grenade, which actually shocks Piccolo that Cell can not even be harmed by it. <laughs> even though he got exponentially amped and doesn't underestimate his opponent. Even 18 thinks it would have done Cell in, and even 17 has to jump out of the way, and the results shock him. So you could say this is sort of 
maybe an idea or a hint by Toriyama that this attack is how Piccolo was planning on actually eventually dealing with 17 as a last resort, with it only being showing 17 can barrier attacks like the Hellzone grenade so far, at least in quick succession. It was also implied earlier by Piccolo that Cell would be a being that would probably seek to destroy many things in the galaxy, and 16 just straight up says Cell's goal is to destroy the universe after it becomes complete. So if you ever think Piccolo surpasses Cell eventually and thinks Cell is some type of universe buster, and this isn't just talking about some Frieza systematic destruction thuggery kind of thing, there's that. And with that, we have to wait until the Cell games before we can talk about Piccolo again, as Cell gets gets more serious and kind of just breaks his neck with one punch. During the wait for the Cell games, Piccolo enters the hyperbolic time chamber, or the Rosa, and when he comes out he is a lot stronger, as stated by both Piccolo and by Goku. The anime by episode 170 uh, though really exaggerates this and wants to put him much more in the spotlight than Toriyama apparently wanted to in the manga. In his training he sees visions of Perfect Cell goading him or mocking him which intensifies his resolve to train and he uses his typical clone training to do it which is actually pretty significant as it means he can be his own sparring partner to maximize his results. Unlike Vegeta who just goes in and does everything alone. We sort of learned this in Super, that sparring with people is actually more effective. So this might be a good reason why Piccolo's gains here are a lot more noticeable in comparison to Vegeta's second solo run through in the chamber. With the first run sort of being handheld by him just evolving his Super Saiyan form. Even in the training with himself, he's almost completely knocking himself out, whereas usually when we saw him, it was a lot more controlled and a bit more restrained. This is probably further enhanced by having Nail's knowledge and Kami's knowledge, so he's having like three guys worth of input, and he can always spar himself and use all of these things to amp himself, so that's probably why it's so much better. Then when he exits the chamber on episode 172, Trunks is actually sweating and twitching at how much stronger Piccolo has actually gotten, and he's just still wearing his weights. And whether or not this implies Piccolo's on Trunks' level again is up for debate, at least in the anime, as none of this is in the manga, but for the manga it's definitely not the case, but you'll see how the anime version continues to gas Piccolo up as we get further into it. A little fun detail in episode 172, we actually get a follow-up to the driver's license thing. Apparently Goku did get his from that anime filler because Chi Chi pleaded with them afterward and I guess they needed to be convinced that he even needed it, even though he can fly. So still no proof Piccolo got his though, unless Chi Chi also pleaded for him too. But even then, where is Piccolo keeping that license at? It should also be noted at this point that people can sense Ki from the afterlife to the living world and vice versa. Like Goku uses his instant transmission or when Piccolo sensed Gohan on Namek from King Kai's, but they cannot sense energy from the room of spirit and time. And this is actually because it is located in a subspace disconnected and void of the concepts of space and time entirely ex as explained in the Chozenshu. I just thought that was a rather fitting and consistent detail that is really only explained in the guidebooks. Eventually the Cell Games ramps up with Goku surrendering and Gohan getting picked on to get mad which leads Cell to making the Cell Juniors. The Cell Juniors are actually sort of like doppelgangers which is fitting since Piccolo is also actually sort of a doppelganger or spawn of King Piccolo and is called Piccolo Jr. or Ma Jr. All the Cell Juniors in Daizenshu have roughly the same amount of power as Cell, which I suppose is supposed to be intentional to show how each fighter would have done against Cell in the tournament, which I think is an underrated detail. This ability is considered a more developed version of what King Piccolo and other Namekians used to create offspring, so instead of creating a weird deformed demon army like King Piccolo could do, he creates the Cell Juniors. And in the manga, only Vegeta and Trunks have a chance against them, but in DBZ episode 184, Piccolo goes complete MVP mode in this, and while Vegeta gets his final flash turned into a ball and memed on, Piccolo is actually helping down multiple Cell Juniors to help the others while keeping his own at bay, but eventually he loses. It's hard to tell how hard these Cell Juniors try against certain people, and there are actually a lot of forums of people just fighting and memeing about it that are always kind of fun to read. Either way, you guys can decide how good it is for Piccolo, but it was good to see him kind of being the most useful one there since this is sort of a Piccolo video. It's also crazy he called on Tien and Yamcha to help Goku, implying they were stronger than fatigued, mastered Super Saiyan Goku. These human Z fighters get kind of random more powerful it seems as arcs progresses in the anime even if it seems for kind of no reason unless they did a lot of push-ups during the wait for the cell games this gets the most absurd and apparent in the boo saga but i'll kind of go over that later as it might apply to piccolo as well 
Although in the manga, after Cell's defeat, Tien says that Android 18 would still mop Yamcha, so fatigued mastered Super Saiyan Goku would probably just get beat up by Android 18 or something. So we do see the results against the juniors again one little time, where Vegeta's on the ground, Piccolo is damaged but sort of standing up, and Trunks is in the air fighting two of them at once, apparently. All in all, these junior fights probably don't mean much other than Vegeta, Trunks, and Piccolo are just in a league above the Earthlings, but I'm glad the anime once again put Piccolo in their category with the Super Saiyans instead of taking him out and putting him more in the Earthling categories like the manga one last thing the anime does the manga doesn't is that in DBZ episode 191, it's not actually just Vegeta that helps out against Super Perfect Cell, but Piccolo actually helps first. This is where he launches a type of Masanko or light grenade at Cell's back while Gohan is going through it, in which Cell tanks it with no effort and he actually just flexes his key in his direction while also fighting off a conflicted Super Saiyan 2 Gohan at the same time. This key flex alone almost one-shots him and later Piccolo launches a special beam cannon at him that seems to bother Cell a bit more and then he also tanks a tri-beam and key blast from Yamcha and Krillin combined as well. But then he just flares his key up again and they all fly away. We see that Yamcha flies away first, then Krillin, then Tien, then Piccolo, showing kind of the power scaling pecking order. I guess it's sort of interesting that Krillin is weaker than Tien here still, considering his whole thing later is, I'm the strongest Earthling. Later though, Super Vegeta uses a Big Bang attack, which bends Cell out of whack a bit. This could be him being more off guard, thinking he dealt with everyone, or it could be that Vegeta is just that much stronger. Vegeta also had a rage moment earlier, and might have gotten a bit of a Zenkai here, if you think those still exist in this portion of Z. They seem to come back in Super, but there's still somewhat of an argument that Toriyama dropped them from the manga portion in a certain interview. However, even in the Boo arc in the anime, these Zenkais are existent, with post-death Majin Vegeta coming back as strong as Goku, even without his Majin form from his re revival. So there's a good case that Vegeta is stronger here in the anime, and in the manga, he actually just shoots Super Perfect Cell in base form. So unless you think base form Vegeta is stronger than post-training Piccolo, this would uh, show the difference. Considering the Super Perfect Cell is pretty much the poster boy for Solar System Destroyer, like Roshi is for Moon Busters, this means Piccolo is pretty confidently under a Solar System Buster, although there are a lot of arguments that Cell is actually a bit above that, as the angle he would have to blow away a Solar System from would actually require more energy than the standard to do it. Even further, are, there are more arguments where people sense Perfect Cell appearing in the anime and think he's going to destroy the universe. Once again though, you guys decide on what that means, it is something heavily debated about. I personally just go with that whole solar system a little bit above cell angle myself with the characters previously reaching those large star levels by reaching a Super Saiyan level. With that, we move on to the Buu Saga. One little detail that isn't in the main manga run, but is still manga canon, is the Future Trunks special where we see Future Gohan face off against the Future Android. And there's a lot of interesting details here. First off is that his speech bubbles are round, despite being a Super Saiyan, which is actually a trait that only the Grade 4 or Mastered Super Saiyans tend to have, and I doubt he's a Grade 4 or he is just insanely weak, but the other detail is that the future androids have apparently been bullying him with less than half of their power. That is weaker in total than the present androids. This can give us a good indicator of strength as well. We can use to gauge things because it means that Super Saiyan Gohan, who probably assumes these androids would beat Frieza, were at an appropriate level for what they were doing, with them beating a time skip Super Saiyan Vegeta and so on casually, meaning these future androids are probably over twice as strong as Namek Super Saiyan Goku at the bare minimum at max power, which makes Future Trunks, Super Saiyan Vegeta, and Piccolo that much more impressive for even facing the present ones even remotely, surviving even a few hits being insanely good, especially Vegeta who took 18 on for a brief battle at that time, and Piccolo who can surpass her by a good portion after the Kami fusion and might be able to mop her while wearing weights and suppress. Once again reinforcing that 5 times Namekian fusion multiplier I was kind of going with earlier. I thought that would be good to bring up for this portion of the video because Buu Saga Piccolo Piccolo is absolutely complete and utter ass. After training for seven years, Piccolo is weaker than Shin or the Supreme Kai, and the Kai above all Kais in the universe and other world. Shin in El Manga Legendario is then confirmed to be about as strong as mastered Super Saiyan Goku from the Cell games. I'm not joking. Normally you could try to cope and say, well, Piccolo just surrendered to him due to his title as basically God, but this isn't actually true. In Daizenshu 7, we then learned that it is a fact that not only does Shin's power eclipse Piccolo, 
it greatly eclipses Piccolo's. So this gets even worse when Bobbity and the goons think the Bay Saiyans are the biggest threats to keep an eye out for and doesn't even have Piccolo registered on his radar. While Vegeta thinks he can then solo the Budokai Tenkaichi tournament without Super Saiyan. Other than that, Piccolo sort of just gets turned to stone wearing weights by Deborah and pushed over and shattered by Kid Trunks on accident. This lets us get a at least a good regeneration feat for him where he apparently regenerates from from this shattered mess you see here after Deborah is killed, which is not bad since earlier in the series they thought regenerating an arm was one of the most stressful things of all time. Although this sort of gets a little bit inconsistent in Super, but we'll get into that later. Later in the manga, he sort of helps Gotenks with a gag against Super Boo with a volleyball attack and destroys the entrance to the time chamber. Super Boo also absorbs him for his intelligence gains that he uses to psychologically bully Ultimate Gohan into oblivion, but apparently then in turn gets humiliated by Vegito intellectually which I guess isn't that much of an anti-feat since Vegito is pretty raw, as I went over in a few videos in the past. So is there nothing you can say about Piccolo at all this entire saga but that? Well, kind of. But it might be a bit more interesting than that. Let's try to dive a bit deeper. Something you could say is that Piccolo, the past seven years, underwent more technique and meditation type training than a power up type. This could be reminiscent of his training he did from the 23rd Budokai to the Raditz fight, where he didn't grow that much insanely stronger, but he learned the special beam cannon. This also happens a bit to Goku, where he trains with King Kai, but a lot of the focus is on the Kaioken and Spirit Bomb techniques, whereas the Z fighters later focus almost completely completely on power, but learn none of the techniques from him and grow to Ginyu Force levels. Someone implied Goku does this type of training a bit on Yardrat as well, where Vegeta gets a much bigger buff after he realizes to use his key more properly, because apparently he couldn't and Goku could. Piccolo after the Boo Saga then focuses up a bit more and gets massive gains in Super later, with his technique sort of peaking and becoming super good against people way stronger than himself. But during the Boo Saga, he never really gets a chance to show it off against Super Boo, nor in Battle of God where his only opponent is pretty much Beerus. And I mean, what does he even do there? That's how I'd cope with it all, personally. But in the anime, and I foreshadowed this earlier, the Earthlings and a lot of the sidecasts tend to get big buffs off screen. And in this case, the Earthlings get a big buff in the other world after they die from Super Boo, where we see Krillin and Yamcha punk on Olibu and some other goons. Olibu was once so fast that post-Cell Games Goku couldn't actually even see him fighting, and now Krillin and Yamcha just deal with him with basically zero difficulty. So would Krillin and Yamcha also just sort of beat on Kami Fusion 7-year time skip Piccolo for no reason? It's debatable, which is sad, but in episode 274, Goku and Vegeta are fighting inside Boo at less than one hundredth of their normal size, and we see Super Boo with Goten, Trunks, Piccolo, and Gohan absorbed can manifest clone versions of the people he absorbed with allegedly the same power they have normally. I've debated about this a bit and how much they truly use their full power at all times in my Goku video, but Piccolo is here and has some connotations, so it may be possible to argue he got some random Toei anime power-up to look cool, like Krillin and Yamcha and the other world here, even if for little reason, and in his body we see Piccolo grab Vegeta from behind while he's going all out against this Mirage Gotenks and struggles to break free. He then combos Piccolo and sends him flying, but then Piccolo returns and kicks him in the face and actually damages him, when Vegeta is always on guard basically. Damaging post-Majin Super Saiyan Vegeta is insanely impressive. In Daizenshu it took Gotenks training in the hyperbolic time chamber to even surpass Vegeta's level, despite the fact that Goten and Trunks are as strong as mastered Super Saiyan Gohan from the Cell games, as Goten is equal to Buu Saga Gohan, whose strength hasn't changed from the Cell games, with the only difference is that he can't draw upon his anger or power up as far with emotions, and is rusty with his techniques. Gotenks is then implied to be a multiplication of Goten and Trunks' strength and super exciting guide, and more, yet it took additional training alongside their super prodigious potential for him to surpass Buu Saga Vegeta. Here's then Buu Saga Vegeta taking kicks from Super Saiyan 3 go tanks and then being damaged by weighted piccolo while he's not trying to hold back as he knows they are fake illusions which either shows like i said piccolo got an insane anime amp or super boo is sort of struggling to properly give his powers to the mirages another detail is that vegeta always credits the two of them are the problem not that piccolo is somehow hundreds of times weaker and not an issue if go tanks wasn't there i talked about this in the goku video but their strength is a bit inconsistent
inconsistent for obvious reasons. However, even if you say anime weighted Piccolo post Dabora statue shattering can damage 1 100th power Super Saiyan Vegeta, that's pretty nuts. As we know, base Goku, who post Majin Vegeta rivals in the anime guides, can beat weighted Pycon in base, who can one shot Super Perfect Cell, who is stronger than ever in hell. We also see Vegeta later dodge Piccolo's special beam cannon, and for some reason, he then moves it to aim at Super Saiyan 3 Gotenks, who is between he and Vegeta like he's a robot. Once again, why I say this whole thing is funky, but his special beam cannon then drops Gotenks after this, and we learn they can't be defeated anyway as they just come back as long as Boo wants them to. And then base Vegeta right after this dodges Super Saiyan 3 Gotenks and slams him into the ground. Piccolo is also displayed as a threat if he charges up his beam cannon here, and the only reason Goku and Vegeta get out of it is because Boo loses focus on candies and they all turn into sweets. If you say Piccolo is even relative to base Vegeta as a Mirage, and the Mirage is his new anime power or whatever, and he can somewhat damage Super Saiyan Vegeta with a special beam cannon, then Piccolo should be above those Solar System Plus levels, but anime only. If you think you can fight alongside Super Saiyan 3 Gotenks at full power and hurt a guy who could hurt Gotenks in base form, then he is basically capable of contending with guys who can rip apart galaxies in quick succession and being quick threats to the entire universe, with characters like Kid Buu possibly being capable of destroying Grand Kai's planet, that is a moon that orbits a universe-sized heaven planet, and with Buhan able to collapse the universe with a space-time rip, if Piccolo is even a decimal of these equations, it has to have insane connotations. But that's up to you guys to decide. It is just goofy filler, in my opinion, that comes off as a bit inconsistent and unquantifiable with how much Boo focuses on the mirages. In Super, we see that with Krillin, it's explained that these Toei amps tend to be because they watch all these more powerful fights, they get used to fighting or seeing fights on that level, and it sort of amps them, but I'll get into that later. That being said, that's all there is to say about the Boo Saga, and we move on to Super, and unfortunately, I'm really not joking, Toriyama really just gave the green man no love in his last moments of the manga. Battle of Gods doesn't really say anything about Piccolo, with him not really coming more into a main combative role until Revival of Frieza, or Fukatsu no F, and more importantly, the Universe 6 tournament. But there are some details to note here for him. The anime version of the Beerus encounter versus Bulma's birthday party and gang is really odd, where everyone seems to come at Beerus super suppressed and not at full strength for whatever reason. It honestly feels like only Fat Boo or Good Boo goes all out. I'm serious, Gotenks fights him in base form for zero reason. Gohan might be ultimate, but probably not. So he's probably just base form. Piccolo attacks him with weights on and etc. Piccolo gets taken down with 18 and Tien by the same spirit pressure crush from Beerus as well and has to be healed by Dende immediately. It's really kind of a goofy nothing burger. I guess one thing you could say hypothetically is that Piccolo and Krillin could see Super Saiyan God Goku versus Beerus at first fighting, then only couldn't keep track later, which is pretty good since Cell Games Goku who couldn't see Olibu fight at first in the anime, if you care. In the manga, it's a bit better, with Gohan actually using ultimate against Beerus, and Gotenks using Super Saiyan 3. Despite seeing all of this, Piccolo keeps his weights on still and charges a special beam cannon, which is incredibly and stupidly consistent with that fake Super Warrior filler from the Boo Saga where he fought Vegeta alongside Gotenks wearing weights and just using a special beam cannon to be on their tier. We see this beam cannon in action during Universe 6 later, so it actually might not be an exaggeration that he thinks his strongest attack could do something to someone who could easily beat down Ultimate Gohan and no diff Gotenks, which is pretty crazy. Maybe that Dragon Ball Z filler was actually cooking something after all. With that though, we move on to Resurrection F, or Bukatsu no F, where we see him finally square up and have kind of a fight for the first time in like two arcs. During this arc, all of the Frieza Force, including Frieza, go on a big training arc to defeat Earth, so when they finally show up, they are all way more massively powerful. And during this, we see Piccolo go the entire arc wearing weights, Again, for whatever reason, he just doesn't want to take these things off, to the point that the Frieza Force calls Rusty Base Gohan the strongest person there. We see in the future arcs that Piccolo, when he does take his weights off, can actually obliterate a much stronger Gohan in a fight later. So these weights Piccolo has on might be something different at this point, and Piccolo does seem to get a lot stronger from this arc for whatever reason. Either way, he has the weights on and is weaker than Base Gohan. This Rusty Base Gohan is technically not the same as Gohan at the start of the Buu Saga, as an example, as even before 
before his ultimate transformation, he went through an intense training arc on the Supreme Kai's world and could swing it around better than Buu Saga Goku could, as an example. He then has his potential kind of unlocked in general on top of that, so it's hard to say really just how strong he is at this point. That, and we don't know how heavy these weights are. Later, we see Super Saiyan Gotenks come and headbutt Taguma and seems to do more than base Gohan and the others, so it's likely both are below even that, even if it is a gag. This Gotenks might be weaker than the Buu Saga version as well, as in the Buu Saga, Super Saiyan Gotenks could zip around the world dozens of times, with Piccolo actually following him in less than 30 minutes. But for some reason, the moment Gotenks arrives here, he just defuses. But we don't know if he also just zipped around the world a bunch or wasted any time, but not implied. It's kind of oddly written, and honestly, probably just a gag, with them not intending to ever have Gotenks involved, because they don't know anything about Frieza. There's a scene where Piccolo can restart Gohan's heart and save him as well, which is something Goku does in the Tournament of Power, or tries to, which could further amp Gohan if he is rusty upon his revival. Later, Super Saiyan Gohan beats up Ginyu Amped Taguma, or Taguma, and first form Frieza just obliterates Gohan. This Frieza is stated on the Fukatsu no F movie site, which is technically still Dragon Ball Z, so you could imply it's retconned, to have gotten infinitely more powerful, but this might only apply to the Z movie version, like I said. Either way, Piccolo's body is apparently durable enough to not allow a death beam to pierce him and hit Gohan from an infinitely more powerful Frieza. Kind of like how Piccolo's body could withhold Nappa's Bomber DX in the Saiyan Saga from not killing Kid Gohan. So if Frieza really is infinitely more powerful, Piccolo can kind of infinitely amp his durability at the cost of his life or something like that, or is infinitely greater than Namek Frieza as well. Infinite can just mean very great, but some power scale is really like that as a buzzword. This first form, as we know, is usually around 200 times weaker than Frieza's true form at full power, which is roughly weaker than base Goku, who absorbs Super Saiyan God in both the anime and the manga versions, with Golden Frieza then rivaling Super Saiyan Blue. So even if you imply only Golden Frieza is infinitely more powerful than Namek, you can actually argue a linear progression from his first form to his Golden one quite easily, but I'll get into that later when Piccolo gets a bit stronger. Tien also mentions that Frieza's power is immeasurable, so that's more evidence, and other than that, it doesn't really mean anything for Piccolo, other than the fact that if he sacrifices his own life, his spine can withhold an infinite power death beam or something. As a note that I do think is important, especially for that why did the side cast get absurdly stronger mid-arc in the original Z anime stuff, is that it's mentioned to Krillin that because he has seen so many strong people fight, that his reactions and abilities are also just better than dudes that just haven't been watching these insane godly fights all the time. This might explain how he goes from weaker than 18 to punking Olibu just by watching the Budokai for a split second, getting spit on by Debora, and sort of seeing Super Buu for a brief moment after watching Super Saiyan 3 Goku fight Fat Buu, in terms of sensing at least. Better yet, this would explain how Piccolo would get so much better as he has pretty much seen every powerhouse in the Buu Saga go at it at full power the entire saga. It also makes you wonder if the whole cast would then get amped further watching Super Saiyan God Goku versus Beerus, and Blue Goku versus Golden Frieza. It's definitely some anime staff stoogery to explain their tomfoolery, but at least it's a consistent excuse. With that, we finally get to some good Piccolo material, Universe 6. For Piccolo, this arc starts off with Goku and Vegeta looking for fighters to join their team against Universe 6, and Sun immediately suggests both Boo and Junior over the likes of Gotenks and the others, including Gohan, who Goku says isn't much of a fighter. And in the anime, Piccolo is just straight up training Gohan after the Frieza fight, and without his weights, is actually implied to be pretty superior to him. We learn after Universe 6 that he's actually way, way above, but right now it sort of puts into perspective how weird that whole Golden Frieza anime arc really was. Should be noted that before before this arc begins that Goku and Vegeta turbo train for three years straight in a time chamber against each other before this, and this is relevant soon. That's basically like the time skip for the androids. And as Goku faces off against first form Frieza in the manga, Roshi can no longer see their movements, and it's implied Krillin can't either. If they could see some of Beerus versus God Goku, this is further evidence he absorbed God into base, as shown in the manga in a brief flash over Goku when he's training with Whis, but not as blatantly as the anime, which it is just directly stated. Eventually, Sun faces off against third form Frost and launches a Kamehameha at him, which bounces off the barrier in the distance, so do all of their ki blasts and so on, and this is a barrier that was created to contain the fight and so forth. Frost eventually goes into his true form with Goku in Mastered Super Saiyan and cheats to get the win on Sun, leaving 
Jr. up next. In the manga, Goku says there's not a one in a million chance Piccolo could ever win, and in the anime he just says, hey, wear him down for Vegeta, would you? Which makes Piccolo pretty irritated that everyone downplays him. In the manga, he doesn't do much other than pretty much prove he can stalemate a somewhat tired Frost with immense difficulty, but the anime, Piccolo actually goes on to have the upper hand. He's able to charge this long, long-awaited and foreshadowed super special beam cannon we've been waiting since the Boo Saga to see while fighting off Frost, who makes Goku and Vegeta need Super Saiyan even after absorbing Super Saiyan God and training for three years straight. Remember, three years straight? That's how long it took for Piccolo to reach the level of base Goku versus Frieza to stronger than their Super Saiyan forms, at least in the words of Tien and others. While charging this special beam can, we see that he can block Frost with one hand and dissipate his death beams with just shocks from his antenna while still charging it. He can also create dozens of doppelgangers now mid-fight while charging a beam cannon that he uses to buy him time and seem to not nerf his charge timing at all. It seems even that when the doppelgangers are destroyed, they just return to Piccolo even, unless you think they are after images, but it's not really that touched on. They are just called doppelgangers. Eventually, it's revealed that Junior, even taking a blast to the leg from Frost during this fight, was actually on purpose to lure Frost in so he would lower his guard, showing his higher level of fight IQ than Vegeta and the others, which was implied earlier as well with the Hellzone grenade during the Android arc. He can then bind Frost and was going to blast a hole in him, but Frost cheats again and knocks Piccolo out by poisoning him. However, the long-awaited Special Beam Cannon does actually go off and just straight up blast through the barrier that could take a Kamehameha from Goku earlier. In the manga, this barrier even blocks Super Saiyan Goku's attacks, and only Super Saiyan Blue actually breaks it. The manga seems to put more into Goku than Piccolo, where we learn that Piccolo thinks the way to beat Botamo was to charge a super powerful attack, and Goku just sort of tosses him out of the ring, shocking Junior and Vegeta both. Shooting a special beam cannon stronger than base Goku is super cracked at this point, and for Piccolo, if you believe this is post-God Absorption Goku and don't believe in the retcon argument, not only does it have Piccolo's fighting guys too 200 times faster than Roshi can see, if you assume Frost transformations multiply or are similar type as Frieza's, but it means that Piccolo's attacks can do more damage than dude who might scale above God Goku who could literally accidentally punch away the entire Universe 7 macrocosm consisting of numerous infinite sized planes or even universes in size and turn it into a void of nothing. Even if you don't think he's using this level of power, Piccolo does reach these levels at least later, no matter what type of base Goku downplay you try to use here, so it would still apply eventually, and then some. In terms of speed, this might put the special beam cannon on the hyper-suppressed Beerus and Shampa level speed tiers, where Beerus was super giga excited to fight base Goku, not only in Battle of Gods, but even when Beerus is described as Monaka against base Goku later as well. This speed has Beerus traveling between solar systems and galaxies in less than minutes, such as when he went to go fetch Whis when he was on the dinosaur planet, and in the manga, Shampa blinks all the way from the living universe to the Supreme Kai planet in an instant in the manga with Ra speed. This is contentious as it's obviously arguable how much power these gods of destruction use in these feats. It should be noted how shocked Beerus is and excited he is to use so much power against Goku, however, so you can decide. In the anime, we know for sure, other than that Beerus versus Goku fight, that base Vegeta can also obliterate Super Saiyan 3 Gotenks easily, and this would also only apply objectively to the special beam cannon, not Piccolo's actual just normal stats, as Frost is also unquantifiably nerfed to some extent after Goku beat him up a bit. That being said though, that's all there is for the start of Dragon Ball Super, and now we start to reach the ending portions with the brief filler sagas and then the Tournament of Power, as Piccolo is not really present during the Goku Black arc, at least as a fighter, and I'm not actually joking about that. In episode 72, we learn that Piccolo might not be able to heal Goku from a crushed heart, but Goku's own ki blast he shoots in the air can. He also still can't sense blue Goku. And in episode 88, we finally get more good material where Junior faces off against Gohan once again, but this time it goes to the next level and we see their progression throughout Super. Weighted Piccolo is able to beat up a much stronger Gohan than he was in Revival of Frieza, facing off against him after the Zen exhibition match, which is anime only. And as a reminder, Boo had to go ultra full power during these matches to take down a roided out Basil, and then Lavender appears and thinks he can handle guys on that level. Then base Gohan, while poisoned to the point he can't see or sense energy, can feel Lavender come near him for an instant and then body him like Ultimate did against Super Boo, while nerfed to the extreme. 
and not able to sense anything. He then should only be much stronger since then as he recovers from such an intense fight and having to adapt combatively to such a strenuous degree. Goku does say that considering Gohan's original power, he should have done better and that he is still out of practice though. Even as a Super Saiyan, Piccolo can still whoop his ass almost easily while still wearing weights. Considering before this fight, it's no shock that Piccolo is way above Gohan at this point and eventually Junior tells Gohan to go all out and takes his weights off as Son goes Super Saiyan 2. Do you think that Gohan no longer had mastered Super Saiyan or Revival of Frieza, which is definitely implied considering how hard it was for him to manage, and this form may be way, way, way higher than you'd think in terms of gains, with Grade 3 of Super Saiyan alone sometimes being theorized to be 10 times that of Grade 2 in strength, or implied to be as such in El Manga Legendarium, with Grade 5 or Super Saiyan 2 being the strongest of all grades and other material. But this would apply to this Gohan, as the Gohan that faces off against Piccolo should be using Mastered Super Saiyan, which should be pretty simple if he can go from Grade 5 or Super Saiyan 2, which is a step above Grade 4 or Mastered Super Saiyan. Meaning Piccolo dominates Mastered Super Saiyan Gohan with weights, then he has to go over two times the strength of Grade 4 Super Saiyan, which using the Super Exciting Guide as a basis, they have a pitched fight. Piccolo shows a new move here as well, which is sort of like a Frieza Death Wave, but green. However, Junior eventually kind of no-diffs Super Saiyan 2 Gohan as well, which is absolutely insane. And Gohan even says, where did you get this much power? And trust me, I was asking where this was at during the Boo Saga. Piccolo also foreshadows that he was going to bring out Gohan's strongest state or true power out again, and then show him his weakness after long before the Super Saiyan 2 portion. So when Gohan does eventually go ultimate and chops Piccolo's arm in half easily and deflects numerous clones blasting him, this chopped arm flies through the air as Piccolo talks to Gohan, and then can blast Ultimate Gohan in the back so hard it actually one-shots him. Junior then points out that he gets too easily caught off guard, just like his dad, and Piccolo then says he and Gohan will trade him for real this time, and that the ultimate form we just saw is not actually Gohan's limits, with them being said, Gohan gets back to his original power. Whether this is talking about him just reaching his ultimate Gohan Buu Saga level, or the fact he's able to just go ultimate in general again, is up for discussion. Soon though, Gohan and Piccolo challenge Goku and Tien to a 2v2, in which base Gohan pretty much one-taps Tien, go figure, I don't even know what they're doing with this guy in the show anymore, and fights Goku to the point Goku is impressed. Even Roshi says they are actually too fast and has to focus, despite this actually being the new Tournament of Power Roshi, who we all know in both the anime and the manga gets pretty insane. This all happens while Piccolo powers up his super explosive wave, the trump card-like attack he actually used in the 23rd Budokai, and was briefly shown in the filler that deflected his own doppelganger special beam cannons during the Garlic Jr. anime filler arc. You may think it's unimpressive to make base Goku even pant to shove off an attack, but unlike Piccolo, Goku has gone through an extra arc at this point, the Goku Black arc, and after this arc is completed, at the bare minimum, Goku is over 10 times stronger than he was in Universe 6. After this arc is completed, he goes from needing Kaioken times 10 Super Saiyan Blue to stalemate or even lose to a technique nerfed hit, to stalemating him and breaking through a post-training stronger hit with just base blue, meaning at the bare minimum, this Goku is over 10 times stronger than he was from Universe 6. However, it actually gets even worse in the anime, as some people think he gets amped and limit breaks to the point he can just take on a Patara amp of Black and Zamasu from just a few Zenkais, and cause his body to freak out with Kaioken. Patara usually being attributed to dozens upon dozens of times of an amp, and Goku Black was even stronger than Goku before this to begin with, and then Goku just becomes this level. Sometimes the multiplier is even considered fighter times fighter, such as in the case of Vegito, and implied to be the case for even Gotenks, with Patara being stated to be stronger in older material. So this new base Goku Goku might be cracked beyond belief, on top of already being god level from Battle of Gods and base from long ago to begin with. And shortly after this, Gohan has stated a rival for Super Saiyan Blue Goku that surpasses even Vegeta, and Goku uses Kaioken to defeat him, which shocks Piccolo. So it's pretty much impossible. He's just Buu Saga level. And in chapter 31 of the manga, we just learned that Piccolo will train two days before the tournament, and it's all off screen. It's kind of uneventful. That being said, we move on to the Tournament of Power. The earlier episodes of the tournament don't really mean a whole lot for most characters, where most aren't really trying their hardest or using their max powers. A big theme of the arc is just pacing and so on, even in the anime. This is why when Frost kind of goes sicko mode after getting gaslit by Frieza to knock off a bunch of people, he gets quickly exhausted and then Frieza knocks him off and everyone just comments that he wasn't pacing himself at all for some reason. A good example of this is right away in episode 97, where we see Tien, Krillin, Piccolo, Roshi, and Gohan all react to five guys from other universes, such as Lavender, Basil, and 
Votamo pretty casually. They then all just blast them with their respective moves, including Destructo Disc, and it doesn't seem to do anything while they're all blinded by the Solar Flare. From here, the scaling is hard to say for the manga for Piccolo. In chapter 36, he's mainly impressed by how 17 beats up Botamo casually and sort of no diffs Napapa. In the manga, he has no real scaling, but I guess if you do some sort of cross scaling between the anime and the manga and say they're implied to have a similar narrative intent, headcanon. Napapa gets beat up by base Frieza in the anime, is able to resist and tank three shining blasters from Basil, who has probably been non-stop training, and gets beat up by Super Saiyan Khalifa. From there, in episode 108, we just see suppressed Piccolo and Gohan sort of struggle with a sniper that Tien sacrifices himself to stop but nothing of real significance. In episode 118, Accelerated Tragedy, Vanishing Universes, we get a really good anime-only fight, which is Gohan and Piccolo against the Universe 6 Namekians. These Universe 6 Namekians weren't that significant for most of the tournament, but during this fight, they apparently sync their fusions with the rest of the Namekians from their universe. Syncing your fusion is actually kind of a power-up concept that was introduced in the Budokai series, so it's kind of interesting that Toei just sort of made it an actual thing. Unlike Piccolo, who fused with Kami and Nail, these two have fused with dozens upon dozens of Namekians have become so strong that even when charging Gohan straight on on guard, he can't parry their attacks in base and is actually in a losing fight against Saunel while Piccolo uses Hell's Own Grenade on the other Purina. And Purina tanks it and sends him flying away. We also learn that fusing with other Namekians has a sinking period or a power-up period that you have to wait for in regards to these two, so you may be able to apply the same to Piccolo, give or take, if you think it does. Another thing we learn is that when you fuse with more people, your actual vitality increases which we see with Perina hyper casually regenerating an arm. So vitality might be a unique stat, which maybe you could imply Cell during the Cell Saga had a higher vitality than Piccolo, and it may not be dependent on your actual power level. It might actually be a unique separate stat. That's up for debate though. This makes Gohan go into his ultimate form, and he wants to 2v1 them while Piccolo powers up his special beam cannon in the back. Gohan says they don't have to worry about killing them due to such insane vitality. Once again, the vitality stat, though. Not only does this mean these guys are ultimate Gohan level fighters, but it also means Piccolo's fully charged special beam cannon, once again, is relevant in a fight on this level, which sort of makes that feat of him blowing through the bubble during Universe 6, which is something only Super Saiyan Blue Goku could do, actually pretty consistent. A level that surpasses Super Saiyan 2 early Tournament of Power Goku and potentially reaches his current god levels. What's crazier about this is that Vegeta states all the Saiyans have evolved during the tournament, with Gohan's only real fights being against these two and Obuni, meaning Piccolo might be tag teaming with a guy even stronger than the one stated to be a good rival for Goku during the tournament. There's also no cope, such as Gohan is still holding back, because Gohan specifically says he is going all out against them and doesn't even think he can kill them if he does. We then find these guys can dodge Gohan's attacks and fight him pretty pitched, while Gohan has a subtle advantage in one versus ones, but when he gets binded, Piccolo hastily fires his special beam cannon too early, which Perina actually tanks. Considering this attack isn't even fully charged, but can scratch up Perina and even cause him to struggle to shrug it off a bit, this is actually still highly impressive, as this is a god-level character. This is pretty much objective as we see later when Gohan fights alongside Golden Frieza against Dispo, who God Goku, Blue Goku, and even Hit struggled against before. These guys all having the power to accidentally punch away a universe if they wanted to, and the story wasn't obviously nerfing that detail so the story could stay cohesive. Piccolo can see Kami and Nail while he is almost unconscious, and Kami points to Gohan who blocks an attack from Purina who is going to finish Piccolo off. Gohan also chops off the binds as well, and then apologizes that he dropped his guard, and Piccolo shot a not completed attack, which is why Purina even survived. We then learn that the Namekians themselves even underestimated Gohan, and they start swapping hands more seriously with him, implying they're even stronger than we thought. It's kind of cool to see Namekians on this tier, actually, especially at this point in the series, considering what we usually have gotten. From here, we learn that Piccolo might have actually been nerfed the whole time, as he was swallowed by the Namekians' resolve and spirit. And in Dragon Ball, courage, spirit, and so forth are massively important components to making your key, as stated by Akira Toriyama back in the day. With it being a huge deal with the Z Fighters, usually are so powerful due to how courageous they tend to be and motivated considering their circumstances. This is also the episode where we see hyper-fatigued base Goku interacting with a black hole-like attack 
which Piccolo should actually scale above. Eventually, we see Gohan get into a beam clash, and Piccolo's special beam cannon blast through both of the Namekians and Purina's attack that was clashing with Ultimate Gohan's Kamehameha. It's then credited that Piccolo is powerful, and this is the power of a Universe 7 Namekian, and they don't actually credit Gohan. All in all, pretty good. It's crazier if you think that Piccolo scales to God Goku, who could even make Jiren power up to the point he shook the infinite void even while massively suppressed, and then was pushing him around in blue. There's also a funny sticker book that's been doing waves lately. It is a sticker book, but we gotta mention it. That apparently says the world of Void has no concept of space or time, like the subspace that the Room of Spirit of Time is in, which Piccolo's special beam cannon flies deep into the void without losing its properties. Goku's power and omen can shake all of and interact with the void as well, but it sort of depends if you think that's what they were intending. Even base Goku technically went into a timeline with its space and time completely erased and just floated over to Zeno 2 to bring him back to the present from the future, and Piccolo would beat this base Goku up pretty easily by this point. Whether this means Piccolo has reached some type of infinite speed or time warping tier of speed, up for discussion. This video is only educational. But in terms of his attack power, his beam cannon can be charged to Super Saiyan God tiers, in my opinion, at the bare minimum. I want to remind everyone this is the term of power as well and not the start of super meaning all those feats that super saiyan god did at the start would get obliterated by god goku that faces off against ultimate gohan dozens of dozens of times over in episode 119, Piccolo defeats the Invisible Man after he is covered in dust. This Invisible Man can give 18 a bit of trouble, and she faces off against Annie Raza later, and against Super Rebrian, who gives Super Saiyan Vegeta some trouble even in base. With his final explosion trump card, the Invisible Man isn't actually affected, but Piccolo then says he can see him and then no diffs him, and just one shots him with a mouth beam like he's a Cyberman. Makes you wonder why the Invisible Man didn't just hide the whole time until the end of the tournament. A bit of plot and do stupidity. In the manga, everyone struggles with this invisible guy, and Piccolo is the only one to calm down and sense him, then no diffs him. After this, Shansa, another disgusting mini goblin man of a fighter, he casts, and I'm not joking, a Jujutsu Kaisen domain on Gohan and Piccolo. It even starts playing a Naruto like OST, like they're in a Genjutsu in the Forest of Death, and they have to swat away illusions that can hurt them while they're in it. Eventually, Piccolo senses Shansa and knocks him out as well, which makes Piccolo really start to put in a lot of work towards Universe 4's demise. Either way, he gets knocked off by the Bugman Demon in both versions. In the manga, it seems he expected him to be bigger and was just sensing his key. In the anime, he blocks a few hits and scuffles with him briefly, but can't tell that he's actually a super small gremlin bug thing and gets knocked off. Seventeen later almost gets knocked off by this Neopet too, but then using his super good ears can tell he's actually super tiny and his exact location. I can't tell if this is actually a gag or not, since hearing is actually Piccolo's whole thing throughout the franchise, but maybe you could argue Piccolo just thought it was another invisible guy and wasn't focusing on his sight or his ears. If you watch the Slug movie, you know that this is actually much, much worse, implying that Namekian ears are sensitive always during combat, but once again, those are the movies, but still, I think it might be a gag. Dr. Jero uses this concept to his advantage to escape from the Z fighters during the Android saga, escaping because they are too used to fighting and catching people by sensing their key. So Piccolo, who just had to fight a guy with raw sensing in the manga gets caught off guard by this same concept. It's kind of weirder in the anime, but whatever. The anime is kind of full of dorky shit at this point, and Piccolo even acknowledges that very detail. In the anime, they just sort of just beat him, beat this bug man by figuring out he's small, then launching him in the air, where it's revealed 17 can actually seal people in his barriers now, apparently. With that, though, our green friend is out of the tournament power for good. We then don't see him even during the Broly movie much, other than him saying he can't be any help against Broly. So we don't technically see him in action until the Moro arc, but the Moro arc is actually pretty good for Piccolo, even if it is manga only, so let's get into it. At the start of the Moro arc for Piccolo, we begin by learning that Piccolo can apparently communicate telepathically across the entire universe. Dende questions this, but Piccolo attributes his lack of being able to communicate with New Namek as their telepaths probably being dead in all actuality, rather than his lack of ability to do so. We also learn that Junior is the first line of defense for the invaders of Earth, where the Makareni gang come and he gets the jump on them. Despite them blasting him with their ship, he just blitzes his projectiles and all of them as well. These spaceships can travel across the universe and galaxies in what appears to be just days or very brief moments of time. If you think this spaceship was taking off at its max, 
Piccolo just blasted them at probably millions of times the speed of light with zero effort. We see the very old Namekian spaceship Kami used to come to Earth, fly off into space during the Saiyan Saga, and it literally almost teleports to Jupiter with its speed in the anime. These newer spaceships that aliens used to traverse, the Cosmos, are probably only much faster than that hundreds of years old Namekian spaceship, with the Namekians not even being known as a spacefaring people, and seem to be just pretty content on their homeworld. Once again, if you think the universe is infinite in size, then this casual key blast would just be infinite speed. But once again, everything in Dragon Ball pretty much would be at that point, and it gets a little absurd. We get more evidence of their ship's speed in Chapter 53 of Super, where it stated it would have taken 7-3 and them days to get to Earth by spaceship if they didn't just so happen to take the ability to create warp portals from another species using 7-3's copy ability. 7-3 catches Piccolo by surprise and ends up copying him and can use his special beam cannon and so forth. Apparently, Jacko can also to survive a weighted Piccolo amped 7-3 stretchy punch. Something is pretty fishy about that dude. Anyway, 7-3 has infinite stamina, just like the androids back in the day, so he gets the upper hand on the weighted Piccolo and blasts his weights off with his signature Cyberman one-shotting mouth blast. Eventually, we see 7-3 and Piccolo beam clash with special beam cannons, and he eventually says Gohan is stronger than he is. Gohan in the manga, even in base form, is able to fight Super Saiyan 2 Kefla and stalemate her after training with Junior, with Kale before even their fusion giving the entire tournament of power a bit of trouble even the god-level fighters. We see against 7-3 that Gohan can blitz into him, but 7-3 can survive a punch and throws a Hellzone grenade at Gohan, but Gohan eventually dodges it and blasts 7-3 and almost one-shots him. If you think Gohan punched 7-3 earlier at full power, even this Gohan should be stronger than the manga Goku, who almost punched the universe away, with the manga being way more violent than the anime's version, but not as powerful due to the anime saying Goku and Beerus would have turned the whole macrocosm into nothing, like the anime did, and rather them just destroying the universe. 7-3 apparently still survives the one shot and becomes giant, but Gohan just sort of beats him down again, but it still takes a few hits and Gohan resorts to the Kamehameha against him, and in the anime, Omen Goku is the one who skated alongside an attack with the Kamehameha against Kefla, but in the manga, it seems like Gohan gets all of these instead and skates alongside 7-3's arm, and is also the one who takes out Kefla as well. So what do you think is better, base Gohan doing all of these or Omen Goku? To finish this section off though, Piccolo and Gohan are both defeated by a Moro powered 7-3, and then Moro spares them so they can all get stronger, so he can absorb more energy from them. Sort of like what Perfect Cell did with the Cell games, but less about ego and more about a primal desire to consume power and eat people or whatever. Eventually, after a lot of training for the return of Moro and Goons, 7-3 comes back and just takes Gohan and Piccolo's powers again, but this time they were prepared for just that. So when 7-3 tries using Piccolo's power, we see that Gohan can make a barrier that spins the attacks off, and Piccolo can then blast through them like a spear and blows his copy in half, which shocks pretty much everyone there, including Roshi, who could briefly fight Jiren with like his own version of UI. And 7-3 is considered the strongest of all of Moro's henchmen at this point. 7-3 even tries to resort to using Gohan's abilities, but Piccolo and Gohan easily fodderize him and obliterate him in an instant, showing once again, that Piccolo is close enough to Gohan in strength that him tag teaming can fodderize another Gohan who is stronger than Kefla without even breaking a sweat. Although it should be noted that Gohan is thought to be stronger still by the goons. Eventually, Piccolo and everyone else lose out to Moro, but there is a final scene where post Yardrat Vegeta is defeated, and after this, we see Gohan, Piccolo, and Goku 3v1 Moro and all lose after a pretty sick combo, with Gohan even whipping out a galactic donut somehow, and Piccolo restraining Moro. Moro's feet and Goku blasting his arm with a Kamehameha, and when this fails, Moro wrecks a barrier and only Piccolo and Jacko, I'm telling you this dude's pretty fishy, can get up. Goku, Gohan, and the androids can't. And with that, we finally get more light grenade scaling, as we haven't seen the light grenade in quite a long time. In the android arc, we knew that 18 and 17 were actually scared of this attack, but it couldn't do much to a Cell, who was apparently exponentially stronger than he was before, who was fighting weighted Piccolo. Here, we finally see it again, confirming it is still, in fact, Piccolo's strongest move still, despite him just spamming the special beam cannon. Makes you wonder what would have happened if he used it against Frost in that tournament. Even though he watched Super Saiyan Blue Goku's comment Kamehameha fail, he still is confident in the light grenade. Since Piccolo is mainly a technique kind of guy, an example massively multiplying his power with the beam cannon to rival the stronger fighters, this light grenade is even further than that, and sort of being akin to his last resort giga attack that can surpass them isn't totally out of the question. 
Moro calls it nonsense, but he also stops Piccolo from doing it. And both Jacko and Piccolo thought it would vaporize everything in the barrier. With that though, Mirus and Goku in their Ultra Instinct states step in and finish the day eventually as well in usual fashion. A pretty cool moment for Piccolo, all things considered. And with Moro here being stated to be the toughest guy Goku has ever fought up to this point, even tougher than Broly. Junior's not really in the next arc, or the Granola arc, so with that, we get to finally an entire arc actually dedicated to him, and probably his biggest moment ever since the androids, maybe even bigger, and even the 23rd Budokai, Dragon Ball Super Superhero. From here, another half-year time skip happens, and Piccolo is still training Pan. So, he himself also has a half year of training. We also learned that Pan probably has more potential than Gohan, and Gohan could become stronger than Goku if push came to shove, although he's not currently in a state where that's doable. Setting up the tone and the point of the arc, where Pan wants to see Gohan and Piccolo succeed and live up to the hype. Sort of representing us as the audience, in all fairness, wanting to see our favorite characters live up to the hype. Junior later is then seen training, and he has his own house now. We also learned that Gohan has been slacking again and gets all scraggly. Go figure. So Piccolo almost takes him out with one punch while weighted, and he then puts on a weighted vest on Gohan so heavy that Gohan can barely stand. This is where Gamma 2 finally shows up, calling Junior King Piccolo. I guess King Piccolo did sort of broadcast himself to the whole planet. During this fight, Gamma 2 blasts off Piccolo's arm and he can regenerate it basically instantly and combo two with it. It should be noted that Gamma 2 calls weighted Piccolo a letdown, and Piccolo also survives Gamma 2's finisher attack and can blitz away and escape in the smoke of its radius. These Gammas are later confirmed to be made to take on Goku and Vegeta, with the guidebooks and Piccolo both saying they rival them. This is obviously contentious, and whether this is just talking about, say, Super Saiyan Blue Vegeta and Goku, or their evolved forms, their instinct states, is up for debate, but I will clarify that this is more than likely just referring to their blue forms, or their non-instinct states, or Goku's Ultra Instinct from like the Moro arc, and I'll get into that later. Gamma 2 also thinks nobody could have survived his finisher, and that Piccolo should have been turned to atoms. Gamma 1 says that he went overboard and Piccolo did survive, showing even this Piccolo is quite a bit higher level than people think. This is also another running gag where Piccolo constantly gets underestimated despite constantly training and not being a human. He even brought this up in Universe 6 when Goku was trying to downplay him, and he's doing it again here. Even these older Goku and Vegeta level androids, or maybe current blue Goku and Vegeta level androids, we learn that since Granola, that Vegeta and Goku are training pretty hardcore as well to fight Black Frieza, and even our sparring Broly, and this is relevant to Piccolo later, so this is actually important information, and this is when Piccolo in both the manga and the movie says that he thinks the Gammas are on par with Goku and Vegeta themselves from what he remembers. And remember, he doesn't actually know their level from the Granola arc, only from the Moro arc. So mm -hmm. if you think that he's saying they're as strong as UI Goku against Moro, then you could say that, and maybe you could say he's not referring to the Susano Goku because that's amped, or maybe he's just referring to the Yardrat Vegeta that beat down Morum. This is all possibilities. This pours into the theme of Gohan, who can surpass past both of them being needed to get back to his hype levels of strength that Pan and us, the audience, also foreshadowed. It's a very important detail that shouldn't be ignored and the author's intent by spamming the quotes. Some good power scaling here if you think the movie should somewhat imply what happened in the super manga continuity although it's not one-to-one -one, is that god goku in the past got absolutely annihilated by ikari broly who is basically an uzaro amped version of himself or 10 times the power level and considering super saiyan god can one-shot super saiyan 3 equivalents of oneself as shown in the super manga this is pretty insane as super saiyan 3 is anywhere from 400 times to 4,000 times depending on how you interpret the whole mastered Super Saiyan, Super Saiyan 2 argument, whatever. It's a little bit advanced. Yet in the manga, Goku is here fighting Broly and base very casually. And Broly has only been training and is actually insanely stronger from his fight with Gogeta, which I will actually get into as well pretty soon. So even though he isn't in Ikari or his amped Uzaru state, Goku is just chilling out and fighting him in base to not fighting how he usually does. Showing he's anywhere from 40 times to 400 times stronger, even in just base form since the Broly movie already, if you are generous. You could imply Broly is suppressed pretty heavily due to not fighting how he usually does, but Goku says Broly is actually getting the hang of it, implying Broly is pretty much almost fighting at his maximum. Obviously, the logic here is that while base Goku is not rivaling Ikari Broly, Ikari Broly is only a 10 times multiplier, and the Super Saiyan God he fought him with in the Broly movie could be many, many thousands, 
I will say millions of times. So that's why it's impressive. Broly is pretty much also the strongest guy around at this point, apparently, said maybe Black Frieza. But this is due to his training with sparring and on Beerus' planet, which is actually more described in the novels. He was surpassed in, say, the Granola and the Moro arc, where Goku was the strongest in the universe alongside Vegeta. But then he re-surpasses Goku and Vegeta by superhero because of his training and all his sparring training with the God's Destruction and with Goku and all of them, as he actually learns how to fight. We see in the manga that Goku still went Super Saiyan Blue against Base Broly, or Ikari Broly, just like the movie as well in Chapter 93. And the only way to say this doesn't amp Goku's scaling gains is to say Ikari is more than a 10 times multiplier to his strength, and his base form is really, really nerfed basically all the time. One note is that they nabbed Broly and put him on Beerus' planet because of Black Frieza and for safety's sake. Whether this means Broly might rampage and possibly mess up the universe, or that Black Frieza would neg Broly before he could go full power, is up for debate. Later, Piccolo wants to get his potential unleashed like Gohan did with Elder Guru on Namek by Dende, but Dende apparently isn't old enough to do it, so Dende suggests Shenron should be able to upgrade him instead. Shenron calls Piccolo Master Piccolo, and says he throws in a bit extra when he asks him to draw his power to the limit like the great elder of Namek used to. Piccolo also says he never had any idea he held such power, so this is actually the first time Piccolo has had the potential playing field evened out, which is good since you'd think his would be really insane fighting Goku at three years old, even if not as high as Gohan's. In the movie, Piccolo is constantly called King Piccolo and Kami-sama, showing how all of his paths in life have converged to this point to unleash a new power from Shenron, technically his own original creation in the past. Later, we see Gohan go Super Saiyan for the first time since the anime, actually, with him just doing everything up to this point pretty much in base form, since Beerus whooped his ultimate form in the Battle of Gods, even in the manga. We learn here that Gohan stands not a chance against Gamma 1 from Piccolo, and that Gohan needs to regain his battle instincts. This is after seeing his Super Saiyan form, and Piccolo says that what Super Saiyan Gohan does against Gamma 1 is just like what happened when he fought Gamma 2, with them just adapting and evolving to his fighting styles and their enemy over time. With that, we finally get Ultimate Gohan back in the manga, and Ultimate Gohan is pretty pitched against Gamma 1, and we learn that they have finite energy, with Ultimate bringing 1 down to 82% stamina after a brief scuffle. Piccolo now can also use his own Ultimate form and catches Gamma 2 off guard with his new strength and can fight pretty decently against him. That being said, this new Ultimate Piccolo is pretty close in power to this somewhat rustier Ultimate Gohan, but rusty manga Ultimate Gohan is a lot stronger than rusty anime version. Like I said, even base Gohan was rivaling a god tier Kefla earlier, and now he just multiplied his power by something probably higher than Super Saiyan 3. In the anime, this ultimate form just straight up brings Gohan to Super Saiyan Blue levels, and considering the movie, this isn't too much different. It's easy to imply Piccolo doesn't have to rely on techniques to reach these levels, and now can just straight up scrap on these tiers. Especially considering these Gammas are compared to Goku and Vegeta, probably in their blue states, or a weaker Ultra Instinct from the Moro arc. In the movie, this doesn't make as much sense as the manga, because in the manga, Gohan actually has to break past his limit and reobtain ultimate to get to this point already being a beast in base form however the anime versions gohan rivaled goku before the tournament of power but not against kaioken blue eventually even after a quickly fired special beam cannon gets barriered piccolo is about to lose and turns into orange piccolo for the first time in the movie piccolo tanks gamma 2's punches like they are nothing and in the manga he tanks an entire combo without even moving like he's Broly from the old Z movies. Then he does one of the coldest one-shots I've ever seen in Dragon Ball and folds Gamma 2 like he's a Team Rocket villain. This guy who could potentially match and fold Ultimate Gohan, who is hundreds to thousands of times above Kefla, who rivaled already god versions of Goku and Vegeta from the Tournament of Power. Not even Broly would have been able to do this, and in fact, he didn't with these Gammas even being way above Broly movie Goku and Vegeta. It's much worse if you think they rival Goku's UI state against Moro, but that's once again up for debate. The Cell Max fight in the movie is a bit confusing, with it being stated that it's the strongest fight we've ever seen in the series, period, up to this point. But it was sort of like, well, why is Krillin and everyone even surviving an encounter with this guy? The manga clarifies what I said quite a bit ago when it first happened, my first suspicions, that Cell is just not used to using his body and sort of woke up prematurely. 
with his mind incomplete, which is why he goes from not even being able to bonk a Krillin to being struggling against Gohan later. Something really weird that the manga does is that Rusty post-grounded Super Saiyan Trunks and Goten can tag team with the Gammas and even do better against Cell Max at certain points. It's really goofy. I guess some cope you could say is that even the Gammas are fatigued a bit at this point. And this is when Cell Max powers up and then no diffs them and they fail fuse into fat Gotenks. Then Gohan goes Super Saiyan and Piccolo goes Ultimate with Piccolo being able to somewhat damage Cell Max from kicking him in the back of the head and Cell Max powers up again making unquantifiable. But Cell Max even in this state can tank a full power blast from Gamma 2 without a dent and Piccolo can't even remotely hurt his literal weak spot with ultimate, but it might have been implied to weaken it slightly. Then Fat Gotenks gets slammed into Cell Max by 18 and cracks his head, and then takes Gamma 2 basically dying just to tear his arm off after using so much energy in a single strike. And this is where we see Junior go orange and then giant. The Viz version says he didn't get any stronger from it, and it's mostly a bluff transformation, but the actual Japanese text of this says that he only gets barely stronger, where it doesn't matter too much. Piccolo then says Gohan can be the strongest in the world if he puts his mind to it. Once again, touching on Gohan being able to surpass Goku and Vegeta and he himself. And when Piccolo is orange, it's stated by Toriyama himself. This is the kicker is that this is when Piccolo finally reaches the strength of Goku and the others, making Orange Piccolo pretty much objectively as strong as UI Goku and Ultra Ego Vegeta, as at this point, they can use these transformations at will. So if they could just do it at will and one-shot Orange Piccolo, this statement doesn't make any sense. What do you think about Piccolo versus Goku or Vegeta if he really is on their levels? Maybe Toriyama saying he's only on their levels with things like the Light Grenade, or maybe he's just saying they could box. Do you think Ultra Instinct would slap? Do you think Ultra Ego would just outscale him and grow stronger? Do you think Piccolo would just whip out a scheme before they could evolve? With Gohan Beast then surpassing all of them, with the promotion material having Gohan having the capabilities to be the strongest warrior if he reaches his potential, and Cell Max versus Gohan Beast being the strongest fight we've ever seen in the entire series to that point. It's also stated that if Cell Max had completed his programming, that even post-training Broly could not even stop him, meaning current Broly and Beast Gohan are stronger than Orange Piccolo, who is as strong as Instinct Goku and, and Ego Vegeta, who are stronger than Gamma 1 and Gamma 2 who are probably as strong as the god forms of Goku and Vegeta. Anyway, we then get a cool fight between Giant Orange Piccolo and Cell Max in the manga, and they push Cell into powering up to his true maximum. This is where Gohan blasts Cell down with a special beam cannon for the first time. In the manga, obviously, Cell Max is like fluctuating between his powers randomly. Orange Piccolo is heavily fatigued. Only Gohan reaches a high level. Some further things about this Orange Piccolo is that it may be possible he can actually surpass Goku and Vegeta if he is relative to them in stats now. As I said throughout most of the video, Piccolo's main thing after Boo was his overpowered techniques he's been training the entire time, which amplify his power level. This Orange Piccolo can still do all of those techniques, including overcharging his special beam cannon to surpass his tier of strength, and even his all-out light grenade, which can hurt people exponentially stronger than his weighted form earlier in the show. But at the end of the day, Piccolo finally succeeds in training the ultimate fighter and successor to his demon school, just like he always wanted, while also reaching a level that could even rival Goku in a fight finally after all of these years. All in all, this whole arc and movie is a pretty huge W for Piccolo, and honestly, I'm glad we can end the video with that, and that's why I made this video, because it's cool to see one of my favorite characters finally become relevant. Hope in the future with his orange form that Piccolo does take a center stage with all the others permanently, and there's no more excuse to power cliff him with the excuse being he couldn't transform before. Even if he does for whatever reason, I hope that he at least always puts up good fights and showings better than what he's been doing before. The way he was getting treated throughout the Boo Saga and a lot of early Super was pretty terrible, and I'm glad that is changing for the better, because it was always disappointing that this super fused Namekian with potential that surpassed all Saiyans, said Broly, Gohan, and Pan, takes fighting just as serious as Goku and Vegeta turns somehow into a background character. Anyway, thank you all for watching. This video did take a bit, and I wanted to thank all my editors, who will be in the description as well, if they wish. Otherwise, if there are any other long-form videos you'd like to see in the future, just let me know. I sort of still have a ton of notes from this Piccolo video and my Goku one, so Dragon Ball ones aren't that difficult if you have a request. Anyways, thanks for watching, and have a great rest of your day.